um, I think it's, it's another gift we have and let's enjoy it for the day. Um, and I think um, Lucky can read yeah. some of the... So how, I don't know how many people here have heard of Dr. Emmons, but he's a professor of psychology at the University of California where he has taught since 1988. He received his PhD from the University of Illinois. He's the author of over 200 original publications in peer reviewed journals or chapters and has written or edited eight, eight books. A leader in positive psychology, Dr. Emmons is the founding editor and the editor in chief of the Journal of Positive Psychology. His research focuses on the psychology of gratitude and joy as they relate to human flourishing. I love that human flourishing and well being. How many of you want to flourish? A frequent speaker at professional conferences and public events, Dr. Emmons has guest lectured at Yale, Oxford, Cornell and the University of Michigan. You know, um, I don't know how many of you people know, but uh, I've read his books from before, and he is like the doctor. He's like the father of gratitude. You know, like you were saying, um, Brene, Brown. Brene Brown is the mother of vulnerability. vulnerability. I mean, this is really a gift. I mean, can you imagine somebody came up to me and said, Lackey, I know this guy. I'd like to invite him. I'm going to pay so y'all can enjoy it. I mean, I get, I get, I get uh, very um, moved by people like that. I, uh, it's amazing how people can be like that. And it's funny because, anyways, I won't get into it. He's a, his groundbreaking work on gratitude has been featured in dozens of popular media, including the New York Times, USA Today, US News, and World Report, Newsweek, Time, NPR, Public Broadcasting, Consumer Reports, The Wall Street Journal, Forbes, and The Today Show. He lives with his wife of 24 years, Yvonne, and their two sons and two dogs in Davis, California. That's a little bit of um, background on uh, Dr. Emmons. So <clears throat> I think that's pretty... In, that's that's just pretty some. impressive. That's, that's just, just some. some. We, we really there. had to cut back on all his accolades. We were like, what do we tell you guys about him in case you don't know about him? It's like, but um, can you read um, some of the, um, how does gratitude, what, what some of the things we're going to be seeing today or. Um, he's going to break this into three parts. He's, he's going to talk be. about, huh? he's going to talk about gratitude from a secular point of view and a scientific point of view. And then he's going to talk about it from a spiritual point of view. And then he's going to open it up to questions and answers. We're going to shut down the chat from now on. Uh, it was very distracting. No more chit chatting, no more chatting in the background. Um, if you guys have questions for the questions and answers, um, you can write them down and there's going to be a time when he's going to answer it. Uh, Giovanna wants me to read this. Uh, it says, gratitude works. How gratitude heals, energizes, and transforms lives. Gratitude is the deepest touch point of human existence. Health, wholeness, wellness, and fullness result from a grateful heart and a grateful mind. I mean, just listen, it's amazing. Practical tools for building gratitude reveal that life is a continual invitation to gratefulness that can be created every day and nearly every way. We will explore how we can cultivate gratefulness by structuring our lives, our minds, and our words in such a way as to facilitate a deeper awareness of gratitude, including experiences and living in vital awareness of the good, the good that has been done for us day in and day out. The good that has been done for us 
day in and day out. You know, some of us have a tendency to, and it's, it's a fact <clears throat> that um, traumas or bad things that happen to us, bad experiences, sometimes they tend to eat at us more than the good, you know? It's like when something good happens, it's good, we enjoy it, and it kind of fades away. But when we had a bad experience somewhere, when something bad happens, it's like mm. that stays with us for the rest of our lives. So I think to learn to be a little more grateful, to learn to be a little more, um, have gratitude, I think it just changes everything. And um, saying that too, um, we would like to remind also everyone that um, as we wait for Dr. Emmons, that not everything and that everyone comes in as a guest speaker that talks and everything they say, not necessarily we agree with everything 100%, but we know that they have go good things to say. Sometimes I know uh, when we have certain speakers. Well, we have it almost every week. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when we have certain speakers, especially, and they touch on certain subjects, or they just happen to say one line out of maybe a thousand lines, <laughs> three hours, three hours, and then they say something for 30 seconds, and then, uh, a sound bite, and everybody, certain people go crazy and they throw out <clears throat> everything. They, they don't go crazy, but you know, just they might get offended, <laughs> they might hurt their feelings, or they might not agree with that one line. We encourage you, do not throw the baby out with the bath wash. <laughs> Please, you know, take, take, take what is good for you and what you don't agree, that's fine. Most of the, these people that we bring do have emails, mm -hmm. then you can email them and, and just, you can email them and, and talk to them about it, but just take the good and don't be set off by something that you don't like immediately. Just toss it aside and then just continue listening. So with that said, Dr. Um, Emmons, welcome. Hey, he's here. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear us well? I hear you well. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. So I've been teaching for uh, the last 10 weeks, my big classes using like a headset, headphones, and then I realized yesterday, I sound exactly the same without the headphones. So this is much easier. <laughs> well, just before you came in, we read... We were talking all about you. Yeah. <laughs> My ears were burning. Oh, okay. That's why you took off the headphones. I and uh, I hope I give you more than one soundbite. <laughs> <laughs> so you heard that. <laughs> Thank you, too. Uh, uh, Susan, in the background, is saying two soundbites. Yeah. Two? Okay. Well, I'll try my best. Well, Dr. Emmons, before you get started, thank you, thank you, and thank you um, for joining us. Um, and I'm not, this is not, I wasn't even going to, thank you. We're grateful, and we really appreciate you coming on at 6.30 in the morning, all the way from California. We were just telling everyone about you, and I just want to welcome you warmly not just welcome you, I want to welcome you warmly. You don't know me very well, but I don't use a lot of words. I say what I mean, and I mean what I say. I get in trouble for it all the time. So I'm really grateful, and I really warmly welcome you. So I'm going to let you take it away, because everyone's waiting for you, and so am I. <laughs> so we're just going to enjoy the next uh, couple of hours with you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, and I really appreciate the extra 30 minutes. Uh, it's uh, huge for me being 6.30 here on the left coast. You know, that's a real grace to get the extra time. Uh, although I was up most of the night anyway, it didn't really matter. I could have started a couple of hours ago. So, but either case, uh, so grateful uh, to be with you today. And um, to say that I'm excited to talk about gratitude would be an understatement. You know, it's something that uh, is very uh, close to who I am. Uh, it's part of me and uh, it's part of my identity. And I've been working in the field of gratitude for uh, a couple of decades now, um, swimming in the waters of gratefulness and, uh, and thankfulness. So uh, it's great to have a chance to share a little bit of that with you today. Not all of it because there's a lot, but I want to at least give you an overview about what I've learned, what gratitude is, why it matters, and how we can all get 
more of it. Uh, something I think we could all use anytime, but it seems like especially uh, nowadays with so much uh, strife, you know, and uh, negativity uh, and the like. So uh, I have a, uh, a PowerPoint slideshow for you because that's what I do. That's how I teach. And so uh, hopefully you can follow along with me and let's see if I can share that with you. We'll see how that goes. Yeah, I gave you privileges so you can go ahead. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Gigi. Good morning. So I've been emailing and texting with uh, Gigi and with Lockie for the past uh, week or so. So it's great to actually see you. We all exist in reality now. We're not just in uh, cyberspace. So technology is an amazing gift, you know. Um, I'm grateful for it, having to teach, and we've all had to teach new meetings on Zoom for the last couple of months. And, you know, I think a lot of us had some reservations, some ambivalence, but I actually enjoyed it. And I probably shouldn't say this at the beginning, uh, because then the expectations will be higher. But actually, my uh, course evaluations for my students were the best ever, and I've been here over 30 years. So I don't know. Uh, something about the technology just seemed to connect with people. So uh, if at some point you can't see or hear me, uh, let me know, and I'll see what I can do. So this is gratitude. Uh, gratitude is the science and spirit of thankfulness. And as you can see there, uh, it's right there in the middle of the brain, and it's the biggest. Uh, of course, this is not to scale. <laughs> this is just a graphic, which I found, I found useful some years ago when I was giving a talk on gratitude. Uh, we'll talk about the brain and what role it plays in our experience of gratefulness and thankfulness a little bit later, uh, but uh, that's just to get us started. So <clears throat> I mentioned 20 years, right? Actually, a little bit more than 20 years right now. I've been in this field writing about gratitude, studying it, publishing about it, talking about it, giving talks like this, interviewing people, and I've learned so much uh, about what gratitude is. And now, now I realize on the one hand that can sound pretty impressive, like two decades, right? He, we must have learned a lot in two decades. Uh, on the other hand, it's almost embarrassing. It's like, well, we should have learned a lot more by now. Uh, it's like, you know, okay, you've been telling us this and preaching about this and teaching about gratitude, Dr. Emerson, now for two decades. We get it, right? We understand that gratitude matters, uh, that there is a power and a potential to gratitude. Like, can we move on? Can we study something else now? Do you have anything else to tell us? Well, uh, not really. I mean, I think uh, we need to unpack gratitude in all of its layers and levels. And that's, that's my job description. I think in terms of my profession, uh, my identity, my vocation. And today with you, I wanna unpack what gratitude is and why it matters and how we can get uh, more of it. It's really a, an amazing uh, phenomena. And so I like to tell people that I can summarize two decades of research in two words, and there they are, that gratitude works, okay? Now, uh, we could just stop there, right? And if I could uh, see you all, I ask you to raise your hands and, and, and tell me how many of you believe that gratitude works? Okay, great. <laughs> so, so there it is, so I've convinced you. So my work is done. Uh, I can go home and go back to bed. No, there's a lot more to say about how gratitude works what it is, first of all. Uh, we can look at it kind of conceptually, the ideas, but we can also look at it on the ground in reality. So what does gratitude look like when people live gratefully? You know, um, what does gratitude look like and sound like and, and smell like and how is it experienced in our day-to-day -day lives? So I further unpack those two words in terms of this tagline or this subtitle which is gratitude has the power to heal, to energize, and to change lives. Now, I, I realize that's a big claim, but it's not as big as some other claims that have been made uh, over the centuries, down through time. Uh, for millennia, people have said really remarkable things about gratitude. Uh, you know, one person said it was the secret to life. Uh, that's pretty powerful. Uh, someone else said it was the greatest of the virtues, the greatest of the virtues. Um, what else? The key that opens all doors, uh, the most passionate transformative force in the cosmos. I mean, these are amazing things that have been said about gratitude. Uh, I wanna know as a scientist, first of all, I find all those things very inspiring and energizing and, and that's nice and that those are all good and those keep us going, uh, helping us believe what we're doing is worthwhile and useful. 
But as a scientist, I want to put some of those ideas to the test. Does gratitude really deliver on its promise and on its potential? And so I've found that it does. It does, in fact, have the power to heal in the face of hurts, in the face of brokenness, gratitude heals, and in the face of demoralization yes. and exhaustion and es feeling. Un excelente, fue un excelente hijo, es un excelente amigo. Feeling pero... uh, depleted. Sorry, Dr. Evans. That's um, okay. I need, I need to mute uh, a few people. Everybody needs to mute their microphones and. Uh, I'm used to that in my classes, so. So no sorry about whatsoever. that. Okay, we're back. <laughs> I'm going to give a chance later on for uh, questions, question answer. Whether we do that in the chat or we do that, you know, uh, over the microphone, either way is great with me. So I will save time for questions uh, toward the end uh, today. So anyway, so let's move on. Uh, how do we know that gratitude does all these things? Uh, first of all, I need to give one more, just one more claim. Okay. Um, this is like a statement, which I guess should be in the form of a question, being a scientist, but I like to state it in forms of a, of a declarative statement that gratitude is the deepest touch point of human existence. Okay? Uh, now, I know what you're thinking. You're probably thinking like, how can that be? I mean, what does that even mean to say that it's the deepest touch point of human existence? Um, again, you just have to take me on, on faith for that right now, and we will begin to explore, unpack that. But I think, again, once we look at the studies and the data and all the science, uh, it seems not to be an unreasonable statement uh, to make. Okay. Um, first of all, I want to ask you to just, again, to reflect on this, to do kind of a, a silent reflection, uh, a meditation. What comes to mind when you hear the word gratitude? or gratefulness, or what does it mean to be grateful or thankful? So we might have all sorts of associations to the concept of gratitude. It might bring to mind people for whom we're grateful. It might uh, call to mind experiences that we've had. Uh, it might call to mind even something down the road in the future that we do not yet have, we have not yet experienced. And uh, throughout the uh, coronavirus pandemic, I've been asked to talk about and comment on what role gratitude plays in mental health and achieving some peace of mind or some contentment or helping deal with anxiety during this very difficult uh, period. Uh, and one of the things that I realized that if we, we can't be grateful for what we have right now, maybe we can be grateful for something that we don't yet have, but we can imagine having in the future. So I call this, you know, uh, prospective or forecasted gratitude. We just fe finished a research study, a survey on that and found that uh, out of 20 different emotional feelings, gratitude was rated the most highest, the most frequently experienced, both right now as well as in the future when we had people predict how they will feel three months from now. We did this study last month, so when, when most of us were still completely locked down and sheltering and all that stuff, uh, people said they were going to feel grateful and gratitude was going to be like six out of seven. Like 70% of people said they would feel gratitude a lot within the next few months. So, so gratitude matters both now as well as uh, in the future. So you might keep in mind something that you're thankful for or grateful for. Think about that as we move through this. So it's not just totally a conceptual idea. It's very also very personal and very practical, which is what gratitude is uh, after all. Okay. Now, since I'm a scientist and a, and a professor and, uh, you know, I dabble in conceptual ideas and definitions and, and concepts. So we have a little bit of um, conceptual heavy lifting to do before we actually look at the research on gratitude. So gratitude, we all know, is saying thank you, right? It's two words, being thankful or being appreciative is this warm feeling that swells up inside of us. Uh, but I like to think about it in terms of two processes. One is an affirmation of the good. Right, so we say yes to life, right? Anybody want to say yes to life today? Say, like, yes, there are good things out there. Thank you for that. God bless you for that. Good things. Uh, it doesn't mean that there's not bad things, right? But it's, it's living in a position and posture of yes. It's an affirmation of the good. It doesn't mean we deny or ignore or overlook, neglect the bad. It's just that we choose to focus on the good. And then we recognize where this good comes from. Okay, that's really important, that second stage. Second step, we recognize that uh, while we may be grateful for qualities of ourselves, generally speaking, we're grateful for things which are coming to us that are given to us by others outside of us, whether these are other people, whether this is God, 
uh, other beings, we know there's some agency who are, who are providing things for us that we cannot provide for ourselves, right? It's people and uh, God securing for us things we could not easily secure for ourselves. So there's a recognition which goes beyond the self. And I think that's really super important when it comes to understanding why gratitude is good because it takes us out of ourselves. It takes us out of our own um, self-focus and helps us focus on the good that is being done for us day in and day out. So I also like to unpack a little bit the recognitions that are made with gratitude. So we recognize three things. I mean, the word recognition is interesting word all by itself. I mean, just to recognize something is to think about it differently or to think about it in a new way. So first of all, we, we recognize the gift we've been given, whether it's you know a, a small uh, pleasure, the first cup of coffee uh, in the morning, and that certainly tasted good to me this morning at 5.15 a.m. here on the West Coast, uh, we rec or, or something major like just being alive, right? People who wake up in the morning and say, you know, wow, I've been given another day uh, in which to be useful. I, I have a precious life, I'm not going to waste it. Uh, that's a very deep recognition that sometimes uh, is part of what people are grateful for when they look at life in a very uh, deep and spiritual sense. We recognize the giver. So we recognize that there's a benefactor behind the benefit, right? Someone has intended to do us a favor who has, who has given us life or given us a kindness or a favor. So that's the second recognition. And then a third is that we recognize there is goodness, there is benevolence, right? So uh, uh, philosophers like to call this a three-term construal, a gift, a giver, and goodness, a benefit, a benefactor. But that, that sets the stage for the experience of gratitude. Now, can you have gratitude without those three recognitions? Well, quite possibly you can, and we can certainly think of examples where you have that. But generally speaking, the more you can identify these three things, the stronger, the more intense is going to be our gratitude. Okay? So, um, and I just, you know, by way of background, psychologists like myself, we kind of like to take simple concepts and make them very complicated and, and convoluted. Not quite as bad as philosophers, but we're, we're close. And so that's when you think of that definition, it goes beyond just saying, thank you. Oh, of course, thank you is certainly uh, part of that and a very important part of that. All right, here's the big question, which I began with. So back in the, I say mid 1980s, so long time ago, right? Uh, I was working with professors who were studying the topic of happiness. Nowadays, we've learned a lot in the science of happiness. There's an entire industry out there that is designed to teach us who is happy and how to get more happiness. We know that most people want to be happy. We know that uh, we're guaranteed the right to pursue happiness. Happiness is, is a primary value for most people. In fact, it's right at the top uh, to, to live a happy life, uh, a joyful life. Uh, a contented life. We want happiness for ourselves, for people that we love, for our children, for our families. The question has always been, how do we achieve this? How do we create sustainable long-term happiness that goes beyond an immediate circumstance? You know? Well, there's uh, speculation that gratitude has something to do with that. If we look at life through a grateful uh, frame, a grateful prism, uh, we should see more happiness, right? We should experience more joy, more happiness. We focus on what we are grateful for, gifts that we've received, kindnesses, good things from other people, just being alive, right? These are all positive connotations. If I asked you, I guess I did actually, uh, what, do you, what comes to mind when you think about gratitude? Most people would not say, well, you know, I feel stressed. Uh, I think about what I don't have. Uh, I think about adversities and problems. Most people have positive associations to the term gratitude. So not surprisingly, it should have something to do with our levels of happiness. Okay? That was the big question that I set out to answer uh, roughly 20, 22 years ago. Is expressing gratitude the key to unlocking and unleashing the power of happiness? Now, look at this chart. This is interesting. Okay, this shows the tremendous acceleration, uh, the surge in research studies on gratitude over a long period of time. So from the mid 1960s to right now, the tallest bar, so this is the number of studies, publications appearing in, this is just medical journals. So this is not all the science journals, it's not even the psychology journals, it's the medical journals, okay, showing that within the past decade, 
there's been really more studies, more peer-reviewed studies on gratitude than in the previous 45 years. Right? I mean, that's stunning to me to see the huge swing, the huge um, uh, upsurge, right? So people have said we're kind of in a gratitude uh, revolution right now, where there's like a global gratitude movement going on, where people are realizing the power and the potential of gratitude. And most of this has been you know, spawned by the science of gratitude because now scientists can come alongside the philosophers, the devotional writers, theologians, poets, authors, those from all walks of life who have said those great things about gratitude, but now we know how it works from a scientific point of view. So what are all those studies showing or what kind of research do these studies conduct? How would you take a scientific approach to gratitude? That would differ, say, from learning about gratitude by reading devotional materials or reading about gratitude in the Bible, for example, which you can do, and I recommend that, and just, you know, you may have a, a favorite verse or psalm that reflects thankfulness or, or gratitude. You know, there's 150 verses in the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament about thankfulness, thanksgiving, giving thanks. So obviously it's a uh, motif which is really saturated throughout scriptures. And not only the Christian faith, uh, but virtually every, we'll talk more about spirituality down the road, but virtually every faith uh, places a premium value on gratefulness and uh, thankfulness. Okay, so uh, here's what we did when we began our research. We wanted to do good research. We wanted to do rigorous, right? We wanted to have um, experimental controls. So we used the gold standard of scientific research, which are randomized controlled trials. And this may be a familiar concept to uh, to most of you, uh, if you want to do medical research or a pharmaceutical company wants to market a new drug, they have to compare the effectiveness of that drug with a contrast, right, known as a placebo, right? So you give half the people a placebo, you give half the people the real treatment, and you see what difference there is in outcome comparing the two groups. So that's what we did. Uh, our drug was gratitude, okay? Gratitude, you could actually think of it as a drug. Uh, but it's a good drug in the sense that there's no side effects, okay? I guess it could be addicting, which is also a good thing, but there's no side effects. But anyway, so we randomly assigned some people an, a gratitude condition. We randomly assigned other people to other conditions. So the opposite of gratitude, of counting blessings, we say is counting burdens, right? Focusing on instead of what's going right in your life, what's going wrong, problems, issues, annoyances, irritations, right? All the bad stuff of life. So actually, we actually asked people to focus on that, which wasn't hard to do because, you know, the truth is, and myself included, that most of us do that automatically. We, we don't need any encouragement to focus on what's going wrong. We, we just kind of naturally drift that way. All right. Well, nowadays, uh, if we look back over all the studies that have been done, and I've kind of honestly lost track. There's been uh, so many, but these findings and this method has been replicated and extended all around the world. Well over 10,000 people have been in these experiments uh, as young as the age of eight and as old as people in their 80s. So uh, across the lifespan, uh, people have been participating in these research, these experimental trials. You know, let me give you a little better idea of the actual instructions that people were given. So if you were in the gratitude condition, we would ask you to write down three, four, five things in your life for which you are grateful or thankful. And we want people to do this on a regular basis, not just do it once, but because this is like an exercise, you wouldn't just exercise once and expect to you know, be stronger or lose weight or get in better shape or whatever. Right? You would have to be systematic and do this intentionally over time. So we ask people to do this uh, once a day for three weeks uh, was a common length. Uh, some studies have done it twice a week or three times a week for uh, longer periods of time. doesn't really matter. turns out there's many nuances and variations, but the reality is, is that as long as a person is doing this, focusing on what they're grateful for on a regular basis, they begin to experience the benefits of grateful living. And I'll share with you those benefits uh, in just a moment. So uh, you might use a journal, for example. Uh, how many of you journal for gratitude or have heard about gratitude journaling, right? It's a huge industry. Uh, Oprah Winfrey made it very popular in the late 1990s, uh, uh, 1996, 1997. She was talking about it back then, although there was no science on it. We decided to put these ideas to the test by doing these randomized controlled trials. Okay, now this slide, and I realize I'm, I'm breaking all the rules of PowerPoint by having so much information on this one panel. 
Uh, but I like it because in six different panels on the slide, it summarizes like 15 years of research on the benefits of gratitude. Okay, first of all, let me just give you one sentence description. What we learn is that gratitude works psychologically, physically, relationally, and spiritually. That gratitude is good medicine. When we feel grateful, we are happier, we are kinder, uh, we are healthier, okay? uh, and we are nicer people to be around. But that's the summary, but here's some of the breakdown specifically. So happiness, gratitude increases emotional well-being, the upper left. Anywhere from 15 to 25% people are happier People are more joyful. They feel more alive, more alert, more energetic when they are practicing gratitude. In other words, when they are keeping a gratitude journal. This is compared to the control group, but it's also over time within that one group. So like a pre and post test, if you start gratitude journaling today and you never had before, the odds are on average, you're going to be 15 to 20, 25% happier within, within like two weeks. So the effects are immediate. Okay. I mean, the, there's a now power to gratitude, which is really, it really stunned me at first. A lot of these findings, they're, they're so, they're so um, reliable and they're so strong and so great that, that they're almost like eye popping and jaw dropping, uh, these findings. Relationally, grateful people get along better with others. Well, that would make sense, right? Because with gratitude, you're focusing on the goodness of others. And that actually makes you wanna be better. That makes you wanna be more giving, more generous, more compassionate more forgiving. So grateful people pay it forward. That's in the middle right hand side, right? So when we receive gifts, we don't want to just hold on to those gifts, right? We don't want to just hoard those for ourselves. We want to give back the good that we are receiving and grateful people do that. They realize they've been fortunate, they've been blessed by others. And so they don't want to just kind of hold on and squeeze onto those gifts, but rather pass those along to others. So that's exciting to see. And then the bottom two are, I think, really super important, given the high levels of um, uh, mental health challenges like depression, uh, anxiety, dealing with trauma. So grateful people deal better with depression. What does that mean? It means that they're less likely to get depressed. It means that when they are depressed, their episodes of depression are shorter. They recover more quickly. There's a longer period of time before they get depressed again compared to less grateful individuals because gratitude is a focus on the good. So now there is a, a caveat. We're not, not talking about severe depression. We're not saying that, you know, if you are severely depressed uh, and maybe have suicidal thoughts, you don't tell a person, go and count your blessings, right? Or you have so much to be grateful for, right? We know that's silly, that's superficial, that's simplistic, that's not going to work. But with mild to moderate depression, we find that gratitude and the studies have shown that gratitude is very beneficial, especially when it's combined with some other forms of treatment. It can be a form of cognitive therapy. And then grateful people deal better with stress. So whether we're talking about the, the, the big, massive, personal, catastrophic upheavals, what we call traumatic stress, or the, the slow drip of everyday stress, you know, the, uh, the disappointments, uh, the defeats, uh, depression itself, you know, could be an everyday a stressor uh, for people. Uh, what we call the, the terrible, the deadly Ds, right? Divorce, dysfunction, despair, disappointment. Uh, grateful people just, they do better. Okay? They recover more quickly because they have, they have a psychological immune system, which helps them cope with the ups and downs, especially the downs of everyday life. And we're going to unpack that uh, a little bit uh, further. I'm going to keep an eye on the time here. One of the things, because it was so early, I forgot. I was actually more absent-minded than usual, so I didn't bring a watch, but I have a phone so I can look at the clock every once in a while. Okay. Don't worry, Dr. Edmonds. We'll, <laughs> we'll help you with that. You just Oh, I know going. you. I'm, I'm in good hands. I know that. Keep going. I <laughs> gave you a very special to? place. No worries there. I'll keep going because that's what I do. You know, professors, we talk and talk and talk and talk. Not quite as much as a preacher, but pretty close. Okay. Gratitude is good medicine. Did you know that? That uh, this is super exciting, right? I, I, I talk a lot to uh, medical groups, doctors, nurses, hospitals, healthcare providers, uh, people in the field of healthcare philanthropy uh, who realize that people want to give donations to hospitals and medical centers because of the care that they've received. What's known as grateful patients, grateful patient programs are uh, growing and, and very popular. 
in the field of medicine, but at a, at a physiological level, gratitude gets under the skin and it does stuff to us. Okay, so this is one, this is just a small number. This is what, 10 or 12, it's like a dozen findings. I guess it's 10. Uh, there's a lot more that I could give you. I don't want to overwhelm you with too much data and too many studies, but whether you look at things like uh, depression, stress uh, reduction, uh, which is really good, especially in mental health, uh, physical health care providers, right? One thing we know that, and certainly we know that even before the uh, coronavirus pandemic, the degree of stressfulness and burnout in the medical profession is huge. It's like higher than it's ever been before. They've done studies showing that gratitude, the practice of gratitude, uh, can actually reduce stress and burnout and episodes of depression in healthcare providers. <coughs> Physically, gratitude matters in terms of reducing stress hormones like cortisol. Cortisol is the major stress hormone, which leads to lots of health problems down the road, one of which is depression. 23% lower levels of cortisol when people are practicing, and that's, that's, that's major, okay? Uh, what about patients with heart failure? That's the H, uh, HF, is heart failure patients. Uh, studies conducted at UC San Diego found that part, patients with heart failure show lower levels of inflammation when they were practicing gratitude. So measures of, uh, in their immune system like interleukin and um, uh, another one called a TNF, tumor necrosis factor, were actually decreasing over time when people were practicing gratitude. So patients, whether they're healthy, uh, whether they have a disease like cancer or heart disease, and then and just taking care of ourselves, our bodies. Grateful people uh, are more likely to engage in preventive health practices like exercise, like eating healthier. 25 to 33% more exercise, that's huge, right? Uh, I mean, a small increment exercise can make a massive difference in health and longevity. And we're talking about something that actually raises exercise levels by a quarter to a third. Massive, right? Less smoking, more efficient sleep, okay? Uh, how many of you get sufficient sleep every night, right? Every time I ask this in an audience, you know, maybe five hands go up out of like 500, right? I mean, most people don't get sufficient sleep. Guess what? When you are grateful or practicing gratitude, you fall asleep more quickly. Uh, your sleep is more sound. Uh, it's more efficient. You wake up and you feel better the next day. I mean, these are all great reasons to practice gratitude just in terms of the benefits. Uh, but I'll give you other reasons as well. So this is just a small sampling of why gratitude is good, good for us, good for others. This being said, not surprisingly, uh, gratitude is being embraced in the workplace, not just in medical settings, uh, but also especially in medical settings. So uh, doctors, nurses, healthcare providers, we know that gratitude is a major driver of things like uh, job satisfaction and uh, employee loyalty, absenteeism, uh, burnout, stress, employee wellness. So many, many organizations, uh, education, private industry, healthcare, uh, financial industry, very interested in the role that gratitude plays in, uh, in their employees, uh, interactions between employees with um, upper level management and so on. So gratitude is kind of taking off in the workplace as well, but again, especially in healthcare, primarily I think because of the, the, the individual benefits for the patient that I just reviewed, things like this, uh, and then others realizing that it's good for the providers as well as the patients. And so that's very exciting to see. You know, when you, when you take the basic science and you see it applied in practice, it gets really exciting for basic researchers that people are aware of this stuff. You know, we're not just speaking to a handful of colleagues in our profession but it's really going out beyond the academy into contemporary culture. So that's super exciting. And that's one of the things which keeps me going and keeps me passionate about the power of gratitude. Well, I think this person would not have been surprised by all the science, although he was around 150 years before there was a science of gratitude. John Henry Jowett, I love this quote. Uh, he said that gratitude is a vaccine an antitoxin and an antiseptic. Now, he was not a physician. He was not a medical man. Uh, he, he was a minister, right? He was, he was more involved in caring for the soul than caring for the body, but he realized that gratitude has a power uh, that goes beyond just, you know, feeling good in the short term, but something that affects us at a much deeper level 
gets down inside the skin. It's really part of who we are. Okay, so we know that this is a good interim summary for you, all right? That appreciating people feels great. How many of you enjoy getting a letter of gratitude from someone? You get a note, you get a card, just someone says thank you, all right? Well, when we speak words of thanks to people, it's like linguistic medicine, uh, which heals both the, the speaker as well as the listener. And a lack of appreciation, a lack of gratitude. There was a very famous, uh, I don't know, famous, but uh, uh, much talked about uh, survey came out about eight years ago, conducted by the Gallup organization. And they found that the number one reason why people leave their companies, uh, the workplace, is because it's not because of pay, it's not because of a lack of advancement, okay? it's not because of these usual you know, drivers of job satisfaction, it's because they did not feel appreciated. They did not feel that people were aware of their contributions, right? They were not getting gratitude, in other words, and they feel they didn't have opportunities to express gratitude. So we know it feels good, it's good for you, uh, it's good business, why not do it, right? The costs are few and the benefits are many. Gratitude is available to everyone. So you're never too young, too old, too rich, too poor, too sick, too healthy to practice gratitude. And I think this is very important because some of the research on happiness uh, shows that it's, it's, it's more prevalent in certain uh, spheres or certain categories of people. And they do these differences between men and women. You know, people live in the country, people live in the cities, they look at income levels, they look at political affiliation, and they find some differences based upon some of these characteristics, right? And that suggests that, you know, you have to be a certain person or engage certain activities or live in a certain place to be happier. Turns out, you know, you don't have to do any of these things that you can practice gratitude anytime, anywhere. It's available to everyone. And so, uh, so that, again, that's exciting. That gives gratitude, I think, an elasticity that other predictors of happiness don't have. You can start right where you're at any time, any moment and say, you know, I'm going to choose to be grateful. I'm going to think about three things that I'm grateful for, three blessings I've received and you know, start yourself on the journey toward greater gratefulness, greater joy and greater contentment. So what we see across the board, and I, I realize I'm, I'm, I'm summarizing, I'm going over a lot of the details here, but when we increase gratitude, we increase performance, whether that's mental performance, whether that's relational well-being. Right? Things like just being uh, helpful, being more giving, compassionate, generous. People like you better when you're grateful. I mean, how many of us like to hang out with people who are ungrateful? Right? I mean, uh, how many of you want to be thought of as someone who is ungrateful? It's like one of the worst things that you could be called. Right? It's, like a, uh, it's like the sin of ingratitude, which many theologians say is like the major core sin. Everything else comes out of that, the ingratitude. Right? So uh, not surprisingly, Gratefulness is a very attractive quality in us and that we find that attractive in other people. But even apart from performance, okay, uh, I, and I like to say that this is true, more gratitude, more performance, and that, that is very convincing for a large segment of the population. But I would say you could ignore all that. I would say even if it wasn't associated with more performance, it's just good to be grateful, right? It's a strength. It's a virtue. It's a spiritual reality even if it didn't bring all kinds of benefits. And lots of things bring benefits, right? There's a lot of things we can do to make us better liked or more successful at work or our relationships, right? But the fact is that gratitude is the truest approach to life because we didn't make ourselves. We didn't fashion ourselves, right? Our success is due to the people who have helped us along the way, either in our history or right now. And so uh, I like to think about gratitude as being the truest approach to life. And so for that reason alone, it makes sense to want to, you know, become more grateful or try to understand what gratitude is. And that's one of the things that's, that's kept me going uh, over the years is that I realize I need gratitude. You know, I realize that I forget to be grateful and that if I keep focusing on the benefits of it and having a chance like today to share with you guys the benefits of gratitude, it reminds me to live in a more grateful way. Okay, uh, since I got on the call late, I don't know if um, my books were mentioned, but in an in a, in a opportunity for uh, shameful self-disclosure uh, here, or self-promotion advertising, the little book of gratitude I wrote, I talk about the three stones of gratitude. And um, 
I'm, I'm going to use those stones to kind of transition from the, the psychological aspects of gratitude to the spiritual aspects or spiritual qualities of gratitude. So I talk about in the little book of gratitude, uh, I propose there's three stones or three cornerstones of gratitude. That gratitude requires these three things. For us to be grateful, we need to have these three elements. And without all three of these, we don't have a fully developed uh, experience of gratefulness. And so the first one, first stone, I call this one looking for the good. So gratitude requires putting on glasses and looking for the good, the good around us, the good in our lives, the good in ourselves, the good in other people, seeing the good, noticing the good, looking for the good. Uh, and I'll mention after our transition point in the second half of the presentation today that we're really good at looking for the bad. You know, you ever realize this? That's very easy to focus on what's going wrong, on complaint and dissatisfaction and um, resentment and all that stuff, but we need to look for the good. We need to take in the good, but we also, first of all, we need to see the good, okay? And the stone that I associate with looking for the good, I call this joy, okay? Now, I mentioned happiness before. I could do a whole two hours on the difference between joy and happiness. I don't have time for that today. Maybe you'll have me back. I don't know, but I think joy is, is super important. A lot of us settle for happiness when we really want joy. Joy is a much deeper sense of fulfillment a deeper sense of contentment and well-being that's independent of circumstances or happiness. Um, listen to this quote by uh, Karl Barth, very famous theologian. He said that actually joy is the simplest form of gratitude. Joy, the pure and simple delight in being alive, right? And so I think we all want this, we all want joy, right? And so we have to have our eyes open to the benefits and blessings around us, look for the good, but we need to go beyond that. If we just look for the good and we don't really take it in, we don't accept the good, it doesn't become part of us, we have to like um, savor the good. We have to live in the good, right? It has to saturate the deepest aspects of our well being. We, we got to feel it deep down in our bones for us to really benefit from it. So I call this grace. Okay, now we know that grace has a very special meaning in the Christian faith and the Christian tradition. Grace is God's unmerited favor, right? It's the realization that we are receiving benefits and goodness, salvation, other gifts, quite apart from anything we've done. It's nothing that we've earned or deserved or merited, but we receive it nevertheless. Uh, one person uh, that I admire and I've learned quite a bit from, he said that grace is basically one-way love that comes at us that has nothing to do with us, right? So when we love unconditionally or when we receive God's love, unconditionally, we're receiving God's grace, right? And there's nothing we can do to earn that. There's also nothing we can do to lose that. And that, I mean, that's great news. I mean, that is the gospel right there, right? I'm not, I'm not a preacher or a theologian, but uh, I have learned that the gospel is simply the good news that we are accepted, that we received forgiveness, uh, quite apart from earning it and deserving it or meriting it. And so that's grace. That's taking in the good, all right? Uh, and then the third stone, I say, that's giving back the good. And giving back the good is love, all right? So you think of these are like three virtues, I guess, or three spiritual realities, joy, grace, and love. So when we receive good, we don't want to just notice it, take it in. We also want to give back the good, right? We want to pass it forward or pass it ahead uh, onto other individuals, right? Very important. If, if we just receive the good and never give it back, we don't really have gratitude. We just certainly don't have thanksgiving, which is the giving of thanks, right? And I think that's a, uh, I think that's a need that we all have, is to express gratitude. Uh, just keep me quiet. It doesn't do people any good. When you're grateful to them, but you never express that gratitude, uh, how does that benefit you or the relationship? It doesn't, right? So it needs to be expressed. It needs to be uh, given back. So I, have a, I think I have an example here somewhere. Uh, Oh, I wanted to mention this first with respect to grace and trying to become more grateful. See, I think we go wrong a lot of times because we try to become more grateful and we, we develop a, a, a set of practices or a set of rules, a to-do list for becoming more grateful. So I tried this once myself. You know, I started to, you know, uh, do a very specific gratitude meditation. I got a gratitude app for my phone. You know, I felt I had a journal. Uh, a certain way uh, each day at a certain time of the day. And I had a list of certain number of gratitudes. You know, I was doing all these things to become more grateful. And I found that it was really backfiring. 
I found that I was really focusing on my own performance and trying to become more grateful. And so I would say, well, am I more grateful today than I was yesterday? You know, uh, am I more grateful than other people? I found myself comparing myself with others saying, you know, wow, look at these other people out there. They're so ungrateful and they're so resentful. Aren't I great? I felt started feeling pride because of my own level of gratitude. Uh, but then when I wasn't doing well in my own journaling or my own practice, I felt bad. I felt like a failure. I felt guilty. It's like, okay, so Dr. Emmons, you're supposed to be this gratitude guru and expert. And here you are, you can't even practice, you know, what you preach. So in either case, did I feel more grateful? But then I realized gratitude is not something that you achieve, right? It's something that you receive. We receive gratitude as we receive gifts, uh, things that we didn't earn or deserve. So that's grace, right? We, 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 we take it in, we accept that good, we receive it. We don't achieve it. Dr. Yeah, Edmund, I, really I just wanted to say that this is amazing because a lot of us who are in a process of healing here, um, we have been told many times to do step one, two, three, it's all up to us. And yes, there is some, tr some tiny truth in that. Yes. Well, so many of us have come from a dysfunctional, normal family where we are told you better be grateful. Right. So what you're saying is very, very wonderful for all of us. I just wanted to say that. Thank you for that. Yeah, I, that was huge for me when I realized that uh, I didn't have to work hard at this. You know, I had to I had to just turn my mind and my heart to the ways in which I was already supported and sustained by other people and to keep that front and center. You know, and, and again, I think it is, as Gigi, as you're saying, it's just kind of unnatural, whether it's, you know, built into who we are or whether we learn that we get that message throughout our lives that we had to uh, we had to perform to get acceptance and approval from others, right? Our worth, our value, our sense of significance was based not on who we are, but what we've done, what we've accomplished. Um, this is known as performanceism, okay? Uh, which I, another term I learned from uh, one of my spiritual heroes, he said that people are focused on their performance and because culture is based on performance. You know, our worth, our value, who we are is based on what we've done, what we've accomplished, not who we are, especially as a Christian, it's who we are in Christ. And so it's not based on what we've done. It's based on what he's done, what, what God has done in the person of Jesus, right? If we focus on that, we can't, we can't help but be grateful, right? I, I think that just because grace you know, and gratitude go together, uh, the, one follows the other one immediately and directly in a very um, reliable way. Okay, so that's grace. Uh, I wanted to give this, uh, read this little testimony. I guess you call it a testimony. Um, many, many years ago, I came across uh, this a book written by a, 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 a English literature professor at a Midwestern university. And she had had a series of uh, heart problems. And eventually what happened, she had to get a heart transplant, okay, when she was in her mid forties. And this is how she responded. She wrote a book about her experience. But one of the themes throughout the book is about gratefulness and thankfulness. And how could she possibly express gratitude for the gift of life she was given by her donor? And the fact that she couldn't fully do it. But this is what she said. She said, I have, not, I have found that it's not enough for me to be thankful. I have a desire to do something in return, right? So this, this imperative to want to give back the good, to do thanks, to give thanks, give things, give thoughts, give love, she wrote. So gratitude becomes the gift, creating a cycle of giving and receiving the endless waterfall, filling up and spilling over. To give from the fullness of my being, it is a spontaneous charitableness, perhaps not even to the giver, but to someone else, to whoever crosses one's path, passing on of the gift. And now she's talking about being frustrated because she can't express her gratitude to the donor family. I don't know if she knew them or not, uh, but n there's nothing I can do to repay the deed. Just like, you know, gift of life, right? I mean, how can you repay uh, the giver for giving you life, right? You can't. All I can do, she wrote, is to give my life, to make my life a gift, to be gracious in my living, which is to live in gratitude and thus grace. So the connection between receiving the good, right? recognizing the value of it, giving back the good. That's what we talked about, the three recognitions, the link between the beneficiary, the benefactor, and the benefit. Okay? The imperative of wanting to give back, needing to give back is, I think, an essential element 
of gratefulness and not just a, a private feeling, but it, it reflects itself in behavior. See, that's why I think, one of the reasons why I think it's the deepest touch point of human existence, because much of life is about giving, receiving, repaying benefits, generosity, giving back the good we've received, if not to our benefactor, then to someone else, what they call upstream giving or reciprocity. It's just, it's wired in to who we are. It's part of our um, uh, factory installed equipment, right? It's not, a, it's not an aftermarket add-on. It's, it's part of uh, who we are at a very deep and significant level. So uh, we're just about right finishing the first half here. I just want to mention this briefly. So one of my other heroes in terms of gratitude was Sir John Templeton. I don't know if you've heard of Sir John Templeton, but he was uh, very famous in the area of uh, mutual investments, international investing, philanthropy, global investor, made a lot of money and then gave away a lot of money through his foundations, which are all about using the tools and methods of science to um, test spiritual laws, spiritual realities, one of which is gratefulness or gratitude. In fact, for Sir John Templeton, gratitude was his key human uh, virtue, which he felt was the most important thing. Okay, well, love was up there too. Uh, how can you decide, right? But gratitude, thankfulness for him, he lived his life under a banner of thanksgiving. He preferred the term thanksgiving over gratitude or gratefulness because it implied this giving back or giving of thanks, not just a, a passive internal private experience, but one which is more interpersonal and relational and outward and building uh, outside of the self. Thanksgiving opens the door to spiritual growth, he wrote in one of his many books. Uh, so he would identify and articulate a lot of spiritual laws, love and hope and forgiveness and generosity and gratefulness. Thanksgiving was, was one of those. When, we're a th when we are thankful, he said, it puts our mind in tune with the infant. Thankfulness brings God's bounty. Counting blessings attracts blessings and gives you more to be thankful. He also said, I don't have it on this slide because it's too much, but I love this. Listen to this. If there is any day in our life which is not Thanksgiving Day, we are not fully alive. Right? Wow. Counting our blessings attracts blessings. From gratitude comes riches. From complaints, poverty. Thankfulness opens the door to happiness. Thanksgiving causes giving. Continual gratitude dissolves our worries. Right? Just it seems... And now we know this, is, this has actually been ratified by the empirical science. So, so I'm grateful for that. And that's one of those um, you know, thoughts and a, a thought leader, an uh, innovative person like Sir John, just really inspired people to go out and do research uh, on these concepts. And of course, very generous too in, in funding a lot of the research on gratitude. <coughs> one last quote, and then we'll um, transition. I'll turn over to Lockheed for uh, the offering. Two kinds of gratitude. So this is a poet, a, a Pulitzer Prize winning poet, Edwin Arlington Robinson, who said there are two kinds of gratitude. The sudden kind we feel for what we take, in other words, for what we've been given. I think that's what he's referring to here. So when you receive a gift, kindness, a favor, you feel grateful, right? And he says, that's good, but that's not the, mo the best kind of gratitude. That's like gratitude with a small lowercase g. Gratitude with a big uppercase g is the gratitude we feel for what we give, all right? So when we, we give, when we give gratitude or we give gifts, we feel grateful for the chance to give, you know? And that's what Mother Teresa often talked about being grateful. She felt she benefited more from the people she helped, right? Than they benefited from her help, which of course was considerable. So the opportunity to give was a source of gratitude for her. And I, I think that's really, really important that it identifies these two different types of gratitude. I think that goes back to the notion of love, taking in the good, joy, and then grace, and then love, two types of gratitude. So uh, I've got a lot more to talk about. We're gonna talk about why gratitude works. We're gonna talk about the brain, and then we're gonna talk about some gratitude uh, practices. But right now, I'm going to turn it over to Lockie for the next uh, phase Dr. of our morning together. Thank you, Dr. Emmons. Um... I don't even know what to say. You <laughs> left me totally speechless. I don't get speechless. Um, it's not my normal uh, status. I kept saying through the meeting, we were muted to Giovanna. I was like, wow. And I kept saying, he's so good. <laughs> like, 
Oh, uh, thank you. I mean, there's well, no, all this is amazing. I mean, amazing. I mean, it's, yeah. it's gratitude. I mean, there's so many. You, you sound like everything <clears throat> we talk about every day. Um, so many good things, so many benefits. And you said it, it takes nothing. I mean, it, you don't have to buy it. You don't, I mean, it's just an attitude of your heart, of your being. And, and you can start at any minute. It doesn't matter if you're eight years old or 80 years old. I think it's just wonderful. And um, truly, thank you. I think it's like, uh, you know, like hydro, like the... Drinking out of a fire hydrant. You you <laughs> a fire hydrant for us this morning and we're all trying to drink. You're going to have to come back every week for the next 52 <laughs> weeks and recap for us because it's like, oh my goodness. It's like... We'll, it's, we'll work on that. It's, amazing. it's just so good. It's so life-giving. I, I feel energized this morning. I feel like... Wow, I could live like this for the rest of my life if only I couldn't. I was going to say, I hope you'll cover it later, but how can we live like this for the rest of our life? Because every, this all sounds great, yes. um, but I'm sure everybody has this question. So, okay, how do I live like this for the rest of my life? Because I get ungrateful, thank God, less and less and less every day. But I, yes. do, I used to be really ungrateful, but like super ungrateful. And... Um, Nowadays, I'm just becoming more and more grateful. And I want to see how I can even be more grateful. And that's wrapped up in faith and hope and yes. love and forgiveness. And uh, you're not a theologian. You sound like a theologian. As a well, I, I think, thank, thank you for that. That's a compliment. Uh, yeah, I think you have, to have a, you have to have a foundation, foundation for gratefulness that transcends experiences and circumstances. And yeah. so for many people, it's in their faith, right? It could be in something else. But if, and that's why I, I try to emphasize the notion of grace so much is that if I think of myself as a receiver, uh, I can't otherwise be anything but grateful, right? But if I have to go out and earn that gratitude, there are times where I don't feel like being grateful, right? Because it's so easy to focus on what's going wrong instead of what's going right. And so it becomes the default stance. But if I have something that can transcend the circumstances, uh, that gives me a sustenance, you know? But I'll talk more. Uh, about that well, as a matter of fact when we finish doing what we need to do and then Gigi is going to do some announcements I, I would love for you to promote all your websites and your books and everything because I really want people to get into this I think you know there are many keys to our healing but I think faith hope and love and one of the biggest keys is gratefulness generosity thankfulness um, it's all over the scriptures any testament any religion and uh, people uh, need to I need to practice it more people I, I don't want to criticize people but I need to I want to live the way you are talking Dr. Emmons I want to live that way so go ahead darling so um one of the well the just the quote the last quote you said um just before you stopped talking and it says the sudden kind we feel but what we take but the larger kind we feel is when we give, you know, and um, our, we have not, we don't charge for what we do. No, <laughs> nothing. We charge we, for nothing. We um, meet with people, we see people, we give, we give. As and a matter of fact, my library's biggest complaint is I give away too many things, you know, we don't <laughs> charge for what we pay for. You know? <laughs> yeah, they say you're giving away all the books. But, um, but the, and many people ask, why don't you charge? Why don't, maybe you should start charging for this. And I feel that one of the foundation is because we are so grateful for what we got in our marriage, in our home, in our relationship. In our family, in our healing. Um, that I, I, I always grateful. feel like how, how can, how can, it was given to us, let's pass it on and as long as we can, we will continue to do it this way. And we have been so far, last Saturday, we celebrated five years since we opened the doors of our place. And um, <clears throat> we haven't charged anyone, whether people can give or cannot give, that's okay for us. And it has worked somehow. It's and um, you said, someone, you said just now that somebody said, um, not gratefulness brings or complain brings poverty or something like that. You know, I think, I think it, it just generates, but going back to what you said, it says uh, the recognitions of gratitude. So I want to do that before um, we 
take um, the offering and we say, recognize the gift. And I want to recognize this morning that you coming in here, it's a gift for all of us. Um, and I also want to recognize the person who brought you to all of us because, um, you know, I, I want to be, I, I, I hope they're on. I don't know if they're on, but I want to be grateful to them for bringing you. This is really such a treat. It's, I'm, 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 I feel treated. So to recognize the gift. So not only the gift that you're here with us, but for everyone to recognize the gift of this opportunity we have this morning. Um, to recognize the giver, you said, and it's the benefactor. Somebody gratefully called us and said, "We didn't even ask." Um, he he is he is in, by the way. Okay. So um, so somebody said, and and we want to recognize him, and we're very grateful. But he and, doesn't um, want to be recognized publicly, so we'll just keep, keep that like anonymous. That. <laughs> and he says, and recognize the goodness, and I think. This is, if we can all raise our hands, I think this is amazing and good. Who's getting so much from it? So, um, so I just wanted to say that. And with that, um, thank you also. We want to recognize you guys because you are also our benefactors. You are, you all are givers and you all keep the doors of hopeful life open. And we want to thank you for that and to continue to carry on doing what we do, um, we can only do it with your support. And this is in a few ways that you can join and be part of it, participate. <clears throat> we all have a part in it, you know? Uh, some, some have to get up, some have to do the work, some have to clean up, and some can give in other ways, you know? And, and keeping the doors open, it's one of the ways, and funding this, it's one of the many ways too. So, um, Gigi, if you put it up, um, there's a few ways of giving and text giving. Uh, it's one of them. And is you text to that number, <clears throat> 45777, with the word hope and the amount. Um, of course, if it's the first time you're doing it, it will ask you for your information. Also, um, by PayPal, if you go to our website, um, which is hopefullifemiami.org, it has to be Miami. There's another uh, website called Hope for Life Only. Um, so it's not, doesn't come to us. And we've had a few people make that mistake, but um, it's okay. Maybe they also need to be blessed. Um, but hopefullifemiami.org. And you click on donate and it'll take you. And a lot of people have been finding Cash App to be very easy. Um, and it's right there, dollar sign, Hopeful Life, Miami. Or those that still write, like no, to write. A lot of people are still writing and sending checks. Checks, um, which by the way, we are receiving them. And thank you very much. It's Hopeful Life. 11715 Southwest 87th Avenue, Miami, Florida, 33176. So um, I think that's the we information. Can leave that up for a minute. We can leave it out for a few minutes, Gigi, like for just a little bit. But um, thank you so much. And thank you for your continuous um, contribution. <clears throat> I think it's one of my biggest joys that I can spend two, three, four hours with someone um, listening to their stories, reconciling their stories, and not have to put a tag on it, you know? I think, I, I think that this is one of the things, like, and I wake up, I'm incredibly happy every day that whether they can give, we can still do that amount of time, or they can or they can, and we do it, and it, nobody has a tag. And I think that is so, such an amazing gift that we get, we get to be able to give to others. And I'm very, very grateful for that. So Gigi, it's all yours. Thank you. And thank you again, Dr. Emmons. Well, I think I speak on behalf of everybody who's in this room uh, because you, Giovanna and Lucky, 
you have been giving so much to all of us. And there's so much that happens behind the scenes. I mean, Giovanna still has a young daughter at home. Um, they are both doing so many things and they're meeting one-on-one -on -one with people. Um, Giorgio and I, since we met Lucky and Giovanna, uh, there hasn't been one moment where we've called Lucky or Giovanna to say we're in crisis or we need to talk, that they haven't dropped everything to, to just attend our, our, our pain and get us out of there into, into a place where we can have some gratitude. So I think all of us, we want to give now, you're always telling us to give hugs to the speakers, but I think all of us, if we could send you, like in Giovanna, a hug and a thank you. Uh, it doesn't get old to thank you guys. Um, I also want to invite everyone who's here with us for the first time to share with me your information. Um, at the end, I'm going to give, uh, open the chat so you can send me your email and your um, uh, cell phone if you want to receive our uh, reminders, our emails. Uh, we send them out every week and Lucky sends some wonderful um, messages through WhatsApp. So if you, at the end, when I open the chat, please look for Gigi and send me your email address and your information for your mobile. Um, also, uh, Lucky and Giovanna, uh, we're going to show the video for Hope for Life or, or you want to yeah, I know it's up to you. I mean, just tell them what Hope for Life does because hey. so, do the video, which is, video. Which is simple. Do the video. It's yeah, simple. I, you don't have to explain it. Well, I wanted to close with some things before I show the video. Um, we, what do we do? We, we have, we don't have speakers every Saturday like we've had during COVID, like in Giovanna, and a few of us sometimes get to give a class. But some of the classes uh, that we talk about are forgiveness. How do we do forgiveness? What does that look like? Uh, strong, strongholds, detachment. How do we place boundaries? Boundaries are, are huge in a process of healing. Um, also, we talk about the normal dysfunctional family where we all fit into that profile of our family of origin. How about uh, what does healthy sexuality, sexuality look like? We, um, a lot of us come in here with an, a very unhealthy or broken sexuality uh, we didn't learn from a young age what a healthy sexuality looked like. And we, we have like three or four weeks of teaching on that. And we also talk about codependency and addictions, behavioral and substance. But the behavioral ones, I think they're all behavioral ones, right? <laughs> um, and just to give a little sum up, I'm going to show you guys a quick little video, uh, especially for those who have never been to Hope for Life. We hope that you join us again for now on Zoom, but hopefully in the near future, also in person. So I'm going to share this screen very quickly. And here we go. You know, I've always heard that scripture that says, I will turn your ashes into beauty. And I've, whenever I look we're going to be married nearly 30 years. No, we're going to be 30 years in January. And when I look back and I see all the ashes that was of our home, our children, um, and no hope, and to be able to see now beauty coming out of it, I think there is hope. If we are here today, if we can love each other today, if we can have the kind of home we're having today with our relationship with the Lord as sons and daughters, knowing He is our Father, He loves us unconditionally, regardless of whether we do it or we don't do it. And um, to see what we're seeing and to experience this, if He can do it for us, he can do it for anyone. We've seen people come through the doors hopeless. We've seen them. We see them. We still see Every them. Every day. Every day. We talk to people, and it is amazing. And it is only God, <laughs> not us. We see people's lives being restored, people's lives being put in order for the first time, not being put back in order, being put into order for the first time things being re-symbolized in their lives, you know. Find their true selves in God and in each other. It's just, it's 
spectacular. I've tried uh, many different things, but nothing like this. Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, <clears throat> something's happening. Am I still sharing my screen? Something is happening yeah, here. You're still sharing your screen. Yes. Okay. So I usually, this doesn't usually happen, but I'm usually able to stop sharing quicker. Um, so before I pass it on to uh, Dr. Emmons, I wanted to say something quickly. Jovi, when you were talking about gratitude, I heard this word. <clears throat> And it made sense. Gratitude sounds like God-itude. Mm. <laughs> and, and I thought, wow, that's, that's what gratitude is, is a, an attitude that comes from God. I don't know. Just wanted to throw that in there. So take it away, Dr. Emmons. Fantastic. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, what I was thinking, Gigi, when you were talking, you said that it never gets old, saying thank you doesn't get old. And uh, that reminded me of another quote about gratitude. There are so many good ones, you know. Um, it was that, um, and I call these metaphors. There's a lot of gratitude metaphors. Uh, and one of them is that gratitude is a universal currency. It's a universal currency that we can never go bankrupt by spending. Mm. You know, in fact, we get, we get more of it. You know, it's like an investment. So, uh, and I can't take the credit for making that up, but I, I try to remember and pass it along when it's appropriate. And that seemed like a very appropriate time for it. So. Uh, that was awesome. So let me go to this one. Okay. Where is he? You all know who this is, right? Yeah. Mohammed. Mohammed. So, uh, Mohammed Ali. So, uh, Occasionally, I'll ask a group of younger people who uh, weren't around when he was in his uh, prime who this is, uh, and not, not the picture on the right that most of us recognize from his latter years, but uh, a younger version of Muhammad Ali on the left. And, uh, and I'm, su I'm surprised, actually, that uh, they know who it is right away, okay? Uh, even students today who are, you know, 20, 21, 22 years old wouldn't possibly have been around to see him fight. Uh, like he was in the picture on the left, but, and then occasionally people will say, oh, that's Cassius Clay, which of course was his name uh, when he was younger. But uh, anyway, uh, he was recognized and still is because they said he, at one time he was the most recognized person in the world. Um, and I, I think that's correct. Well, anyway, uh, if you know anything about Ali and his persona, his person, <coughs> excuse me, his personality, uh, I think you would say he was probably not the most humble person uh, in the world. In fact, his lack of humility was very legendary. And uh, my favorite story involving Muhammad Ali was he was flying to one of his engagements, right? And uh, the pilot comes on the uh, intercom system loudspeaker and says, uh, folks, we're about to go through some turbulence. Will you please fasten your, return to your seats and please fasten your seatbelts. And so, you know, people started doing that. And the flight attendants were walking up and down the aisle, uh, making sure that all the passengers had fastened their seatbelts. And one of them came upon the, the row where Muhammad Ali was sitting and noticed that he had not fastened his seatbelt. And so she said to him, uh, sir, you're going to need to fasten your seatbelt. And so Ali looked at her very uh, proudly, very arrogantly, very Muhammad Ali-like. And he said to her, Superman don't need no seatbelt. And very quickly, she looked at him and said, Superman don't need no airplane either. Now, please fasten your seatbelt. Now, uh, one of the reasons why I like that story so much, well, first, it's just funny. Uh, but also, it, I, I think it's, uh, it um, is a good reminder that uh, most of us, if we're honest, will we'll realize and admit that we're not Superman, okay? that we are not invincible, that we have our flaws, we have our weaknesses. We need help from others. We cannot do it all by ourselves, right? And um, that's really what, where gratitude begins with this realization, you know, that, that there's much in life to be dealt with and to be coped with, and that dealing and coping in life usually goes better uh, when it, we go at it with others, right? We need help, we need guidance, we need assistance. We're, we're not invincible, we're not Superman and Superwoman. 
uh, and so forth. We, we can't fly uh, without an airplane. So uh, I mentioned that just as an introduction to the second half of the presentation today, because it's a really good illustration of one of the basic elements of why gratitude works. And I've identified and articulated three of these concepts, which again, I uh, unpack a little bit more in the little book of gratitude. And I call this the ARC of gratitude. And ARC is simply an, an acronym where each letter stands for, I think, a very important process by which gratitude works. So I think we established that, that gratitude does work. It does bring healing. It does energize lives. And people say it changes their lives as well. And I, I think all those are accurate and true. But why does it do so? It, what, what's the mechanism by which gratitude has its effects? Okay. And I think that's important to uncover and unpack because we want, we want to not just describe, but we also want to explain, okay? So amplify. Let's talk about the amplification effect of gratitude. What does it mean to amplify something? Well, uh, sometimes we amplify sound by turning up the volume, right, on our speaker or on our phone or on our uh, laptop. Sometimes we magnify what we see, words in print, uh, if you're like me, as you get older, you need either reading glasses or a uh, magnifying glass to see very small print, fine print, tiny print. So magnification is making it bigger. It's amplifying. Okay? A, a speaker or a, uh, a amplifier amplifies sound, turns up the volume. Well, that's how I think about gratitude. Gratitude amplifies the good. It amplifies the good that we see around us, that we notice, that we recognize when we look for the good, see the good, take in the good. It turns up the volume on the good, right? It, everything, when we look at life through a lens of gratitude, things look bigger and, and, and brighter and bolder. They just stand out when we, when we put on our, our gratitude glasses. And so it's an amplification, amplification. It's turning up the volume on the good, which we need to, right? Just think about, you know, when, when, you, when you take a meal and eat a meal with gratitude, doesn't it taste better? Uh, when you wake up in the morning and you say, wow, I've been given another day in which to be useful. I'm so grateful for the life that I have. Uh, the day looks brighter and you're more hopeful and optimistic. Uh, you know, you look at, look at any sphere of life and when you approach it through the lens of gratitude, because gratitude is a, is a way of seeing that changes our gaze. Now the volume is turned up on the good. We can get more enjoyment. Gratitude is a celebration of life. One person said that when, when we're grateful, we're in a mode of celebration, okay? And, and that's a great thing. Now, a lot of us celebrate gratitude one day a year, Thanksgiving Day. But as Sir John Templeton said, if there's any day in our life which is not Thanksgiving Day, we're not fully alive. So we amplify the good by being grateful. The R in the equation or the acronym stands for rescue. And this is where the Muhammad Ali story comes in because we're not super people in the sense that we need others. We need to be rescued. We need to be rescued from ourselves, first of all, right? <clears throat> because we have all kinds of things which get in the way of being grateful. We have obstacles and roadblocks and hindrances. So, uh, you know, and you can think of some of these right now. Again, if you were sharing, if the chat was open, I'd say, okay, so mention to me uh, one obstacle. What gets in the way of gratitude? And you might say things like, well, uh, forgetfulness, maybe resentfulness, <clears throat> right? Uh, a sense of entitlement, right? I earned this. I deserve this good thing. How can you be grateful and resentful and grateful and entitled at the same time? You can't. It's impossible. They rule each other out. They cancel each other out. Uh, just overall negativity. The image on the right uh, is a little uh, symbol that stands for the mind's tendency to be negative or to focus on what's going wrong. Now, uh, I guarantee if you, if you re read any book on happiness, or positive emotions, or in this, this relatively new field of psychology known as positive psychology, uh, I guarantee at some point the, the speaker or the author is going to bring up the negativity bias, which is the tendency of our, of our minds to focus on what's going wrong. So, and this is really built in, you know, and for lots of reasons, probably from an evolutionary point of view, uh, it was very beneficial for our ancestors to focus on all kinds of threats to survival in their environment. All right, so they had to have a sensitive nervous system that said, okay, if they hear like a rustling in the woods, that could be a predator, right? Uh, that could be a lion or a tiger. Uh, it's probably not just the wind, right? And so 
then that would be very beneficial, right? Because then if you thought it was a lion or a tiger, it turned out not to be, nothing lost, right? Uh, but if you thought it was just the wind or a tree or, or a leaf or a branch or whatever, and it turned out it was some sort of deadly predator, that could be it for you, right? And so you would not have survived. So we, 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 we evolved this bias to look for the bad, to notice the bad, to, to focus on what's going wrong, which uh, can be very beneficial in dangerous environments or threatening times, right? Because they could keep us safe and so on. But for most of the time, most of our lives, where we're not dealing with life and death threats, uh, this becomes a problem. It becomes a burden and an obstacle to grateful living because we're focusing on what we don't have as opposed to what we do have. We're focused on, on complaints instead of compliments, on pain over pleasure, right? Uh, one bad thing after another. It seems like there, there's two types of news in the world. Uh, there's bad news and then there's really bad news, you know? Um, that reminded me of the story of a man who goes to his doctor for his annual checkup and uh, gets the checkup, you know, gets the blood work done and has some other tests. And the doctor says, okay, I'll call you in a couple of days with all the results. So uh, a couple of days goes by and the doctor calls the man up and the doctor says, well, I've got some bad news and I've got some really bad news. And, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the man says, well, okay, um, uh, give, me, give me the bad news first. Okay. And the doctor says, well, the bad news is that you have <clears throat> 24 hours to live. And the man says, that's the bad news? What's the really bad news? Doctor says, I was supposed to call you yesterday. That's, that's the way it is, it seems sometimes, right? There's only two types of news. It's never good news, right? Well, gratitude is good news. Gratitude tells us there's people out there. There's, there's resources to draw upon. There's goodness in the world. There's kindness, there's favors. There's people looking out for us. You know, doing things for us we cannot do for ourselves. That's good news. Gratitude rescues us from negativity, from despair, from disappointment, from disillusionment, dysfunction, all the deadly, terrible Ds, okay? Uh, and then third, so the C in ARC stands for connection, okay? Uh, maybe the most important, I don't know, they're all important, uh, but gratitude connects us. And just a moment's reflection, uh, I think you'll come to that conclusion too, which gratitude is relational. It's profoundly other directed, whether we're talking about God, whether we're talking about other people. Gratitude is what uh, builds bonds of connection. It strengthens connections between us. It's in the, it's in the presence of uh, relationships where the power of gratitude is most deeply experienced or lack thereof in the case of non-gratitude or ingratitude. Right? So gratitude is something which strengthens the bonds between people. Uh, when we express gratitude to someone because they've been kind to us, that relationship now is altered. It's changed. It's deepened. It's strengthened. And these bonds, once they're strengthened over time, are not easily unraveled. Okay? But a lot of relationships are easily unraveled. They're held together by just a filament, by just a thread, you know? And so it's so easy to break those apart when there's disagreements and misunderstandings and hurts and slights and so forth, and what strengthens those relationships so they can withstand some of those inevitable, because of this negativity bias, the inevitability of conflicts and disagreements is real and it's palpable. We need a, we need a bonding agent. We need a filler. We need like an emotional spackle, which gets in the cracks of the relationships and makes them stronger and secure. And that's what gratitude does. Gratitude, in fact, connects. So gratitude amplifies gratitude uh, rescues and gratitude connects. So that's the arc of gratitude. It, it, and I think the relational aspect, it, it's easy to overlook because we tend to be very um, private and, and self-focused, that's what psychology has demonstrated. But this takes us outside of ourselves and helps us realize that without gratitude, our relationships would just, they would just sputter, they would conk out. And we need gratitude because it, it, it makes those bonds even more sustainably stronger over time. Okay, now, uh, I mentioned before that we make some distinctions in the, in the science, in the academic study of gratitude. So um, you guys have been very patient. If you'll just bear with me a little bit more, one more distinction. I think this is an important one when it comes to everyday life. When, when gratitude is lived on the ground, uh, just the words that we use to describe our experience are really important. Okay, so for example, Here's one distinction, and I tweeted this out yesterday, and I, don't, I, I, I stopped tweeting just because there's so much bad stuff and negativity on Twitter. 
And also because you know what happened? I learned, I was actually getting more followers and like everyone else, I like followers, right? You know, you feel good, feel more important if people uh, are listening to what you're saying. Uh, the, the less I tweeted, the more followers I got. Go figure, right? Uh, so maybe it's a good thing to be quiet on social media. But I tweeted this down. People seem to like it. So I wanted to include it today to mention to you guys that I think that gratitude is good, but gratefulness is greater. Okay. That gratitude is a response. It's a feeling uh, to goodness and to gifts and to favors. And that's good, right? Uh, but gratefulness is a, is a way of approaching life. Gratefulness is an overall orientation toward life. It's a way of being in the world. It's not, it's not an occasional practice that says, okay, let's write in our gratitude journal today. Let's think of something that we're grateful for. Uh, let's go express gratitude to someone today because, you know, we know it's, it's good for us. And we, then we do that and we check it off our list. And then we don't think about it again. But if it's, a, if it's a deeper way of being in the world, it's something which is really part of who we are. We don't have to worry about doing it or thinking about it or practicing it. We just live gratitude. Okay? And I think the difference between these two is that gratitude as a response is conditioned on circumstances. It's, so it's more reactive. It's like when something good happens, I'm going to be grateful. When I receive a kindness, I'm grateful. When I have a success in my life or a victory or a, something good happens, I hear good news, I'm grateful. Okay? Now, I, I wouldn't want to discount that. It's certainly better than being ungrateful, but it's not the deep kind of gratefulness which transcends circumstances and experiences, which is unconditional gratitude. It's saying that no matter what's happening in life, I'm going to choose to be grateful. Right? It's an attitude as opposed to a feeling. It says, you know, life could be bad right now, but I, I can still be grateful for the opportunity that exists in my situation or the realization that things will change. I have hope for the future and that I can be grateful for things which are going to happen three months from now or a year from now or whatever. I can project my gratitude into the future. That's very different, you see, than something which is targeted for a specific thing happening to me right now. So I think this is a valid distinction. I think this is super helpful when people say, you know, I'm not grateful or I don't feel grateful. And then, you know, maybe it's not the best time to parse and talk about nuances when people are going through very bad times, obviously. Uh, but it could be a useful distinction to say that, you know, yes, it doesn't make sense. I mean, who would be grateful going through trials and suffering and tribulation? Who's going to be grateful in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of, you know, racism? and all bad stuff you know, that we see on a regular basis and uncertainties and difficulties and, and stress and strain and all that. How could you be, you can't feel grateful for those things. Of course not, right? But gratitude is not a feeling. It's an orientation toward life, which says that despite the bad stuff happening, I'm gonna choose a grateful response. And sometimes that's you know, uh, actually made stronger and deeper in the face of having the bad stuff happening, the suffering, uh, then if you just have a series of successes and victories without being tried, having the trials, the trials, as we know, deep in our faith sometimes. And, and you know, gratitude is part of this faith. And so I, don't, I just think that's an important distinction worth focusing on and worth keeping in mind sometimes when we inevitably have those times we don't feel grateful, as, as Lockie confessed. And I confess, too, a lot of times I don't feel that grateful, even though I'm, you know, supposed to be this person who knows something about gratitude. It's not always easily put into practice, right? There, there's just times where it's a challenge. But if we keep in mind that it's an overall orientation, I think it's easier to draw, draw back to it and to press into it, uh, our gratitude, even though we might not feel it at the time. And you know, even the happiest people are not happy 100% of the time. So why should the grateful people, why should they be any different? We're not gonna be grateful 100% of the time either. But we do know that gratitude will work. Whether we call it gratitude or gratefulness, you know, it's not that big a deal. I just think it's, you know, sometimes important to make these distinctions anytime, anywhere, for anyone. And we've learned that is true from our research. Well, I mentioned one metaphor before, and there it is, number two, the, the universal currency uh, that we can't go bankrupt by spending. That's a good one. Metaphors are, are good, right? Because they, they help us um, capture and encapsulate basic truths in a very memorable way. And so in the little book of gratitude, I, I have a, a very short uh, chapter because it's a small, short book anyway, on some of my favorite gratitude metaphors. 
And I've already referred to it as something which enhances our performance. So here's one. It's the ultimate performance enhancing substance. Uh, that might be a good way to you know, communicate to someone the power and potential of gratitude. Gratitude is the fabric of our lives. Right? It's really wired into who we are. And as a fabric, fabrics you know, connect us to other people. And so gratitude does that, obviously, because it's relational strengthening. How about this one? Gra gratefulness is an operating system. It's not an app. It's really built in to who we are. It's not something you can just add on, like an aftermarket add-on to your automobile. Or you get an app for your phone to practice gratitude. And I mentioned I tried that. Now, I realize that that may work for some people. So I don't want to just discount it uh, or just, you know, to minimize its value. But for me, it didn't work so much because I, I just try to live and, and breathe gratefulness. Okay? And trying to do it as a specific task during the day, whether it's a journal or an app on my phone, actually got in the way. It actually undermined my ability to be grateful. But I understand that because not one size fits all. Some people may benefit from something like that. Uh, gifted, not scripted. There's no script for gratitude, uh, but it's the realization that you've been gifted, that life is a gift. Being with you, talking to you this morning from California and you're in Florida and seeing you, seeing your faces, I mean, that's, that's amazing. We could take that for granted. Uh, that's a gift, right? And then life itself can be full of these gifts. And with that realization, we get more and more gratefulness. Well, here's one more of those. And that is gratitude is fertilizer for the mind. That's an interesting one. Uh, I don't know if you uh, have a garden or grow gardens and what grows in your area. Uh, tomatoes grow pretty good out here in, in California. And so uh, we have, uh, uh, that's pretty much the only thing I grow in my garden are tomatoes and they like fertilizer. It uh, makes the plants, uh, the, the roots go deeper and uh, it makes the nutrients go up into the plants. So the tomatoes become bigger and riper and all that sort of thing. Well, gratitude is like fertilizer for the mind in the sense that it, it improves connections and improves the functioning uh, of the mind, just like fertilizer improves the functioning of what it is that you fertilize, right? Now, this is very interesting when it comes to the neurobiology of gratitude. Uh, that's beginning to be explored by scientists. They're, tr they're starting to try to understand what goes on inside the brain when a person is grateful. What, what does your brain look like on gratitude? I think some of this was uh, stimulated and inspired by the, um, the work on um, uh, changes in the brain, right? Uh, neuroplasticity, I don't know if some of you have heard of this or are aware of it, um, but it's become very popular. It's, it's real good scientific research, but it's also been uh, popularized so that people who know nothing about the brain can still understand it and benefit from the research on neuroplasticity. So basically our brains are changing and developing throughout life, okay? And yes, as we get older, we're, we're losing parts of the brain, but we also can gain structures as well. And we can deepen and densify uh, regions of the brain as well through concerted uh, practice over time. And so Donald Hebb was a, uh, a neuroscientist many, many years ago. This is like in the middle part of the 20th century and became very famous for this statement when he said that like 70 years ago. Neurons that fire together, wire together. Neurons that fire together. And what he's saying is that the, the brain is back. So when the mind changes, the brain changes too. Now, a more contemporary view of this would say that positive neural traits are built up from positive mental states. So what we focus our mind on actually changes or can has potential to change the structure of the brain. What we think about, what we feel. So if we focus our minds on, on uh, ingratitude, anxiety, stress, resentment, entitlement, anger, irritability, our brain will start to take the shape of those experiences. Right? If we focus our mind on what we are thankful for, our brain will start to take the shape of gratitude. So you might say that uh, what, what flows through the mind sculpts the brain. That's the modern version of neurons that fire together, wire together. What flows through the mind sculpts the brain. I think this is super interesting. I don't understand all of it, uh, I don't understand all of the ramifications or implications of it, but I do think it's potentially important. Um, Dr. Rick Hansen, who is out in my area, he's actually in uh, Northern California, Marin County, so north of San Francisco. 
He's written quite a bit about this. Uh, he wrote a book called Buddha's Brain, very uh, popular some years ago. Uh, a more recent book called uh, Hardwiring Happiness. Hardwiring Happiness. You can actually hardwire happiness into your brain by engaging in experiences to build happiness. Not surprisingly, one of which is gratitude. And he's the one who came up with that uh, saying, what flows through your mind sculpts your brain, which we know as the science of neuroplasticity. So here's just one quote from a very uh, uh, initial part of his uh, book, Hardwired Happiness. He says, if you want to develop more gratitude, keep resting your mind on feeling thankful. Obviously, right, that makes sense. You wouldn't become more grateful by focusing on ingratitude, what you didn't have. But he's saying beyond that, it can actually start to shape your brain. Okay? You can use your mind to change your brain for the better, which then is going to change your mind for the better as well, because it's going to make it more easy to have more grateful experiences. Now, the question becomes, you know, what does a grateful brain look like? What have we learned about the neurobiology or a neurochemistry of gratitude? And again, it's pretty early in terms of the science. There's a handful of studies. Uh, I should say, uh, just one disclaimer, it, it's very difficult to study the, a topic like this, not just because it, it re, uh, requires very expensive instrumentation like a scanning machine, uh, but also because it's very difficult to uh, identify a, a discrete and clear state of gratitude in the laboratory, which is um, separate from other experiences you might have. Okay. That's what's required to show that, okay, this part of the brain is about gratitude or lights up or has more, uh, you know, oxygen flow, more blood flow when you're grateful. Because as we've seen, when you're grateful, you're also happier, uh, you're more joyful, you are, what, more generous probably more empathy, more compassionate. So all these uh, experiences tend to overlap. And so we don't know when some part of the brain lights up, is it because a person is feeling compassionate or happy or joyful? Maybe they're feeling indebted uh, as another element of gratitude. But nevertheless, all those things, all you know, taking those, all those into account, we have learned. So here's a person being scanned, right about to go in the scanner. Oh yeah, this is what it looks like. If you ever see the results of a brain scanning, so uh, so what you have basically is your um, brain reaching out and shaking hands with your heart. <laughs> I like that um, visual because gratitude involves both the, the the mind and the heart, right? The grateful mind and the grateful heart. We've seen reap massive advantages when it comes to uh, health and happiness and well-being and wholeness and wellness and fullness as a result of a of a grateful heart and a grateful mind. But actually what's happening at a deeper level is that three structures seem to be involved. And so I'll try to keep this fairly uh, uh, superficial here. You have a re reward network, which processes rewards or pleasure, right? So that's what gratitude involves because you are receiving a pleasure. You're focusing on a good thing. You're affirming the good, right? But you're also recognizing where that good came from. So that's the second network, which is the cognitive social perspective taking. So the um, ventral tegmentum area, right, the VTA, ventral tegmental, that is part of the reward network, as well as the medial prefrontal cortex, actually the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. The medial prefrontal cortex is more of the social perspective taking. So this is theory of mind. So when we receive a benefit, we know that someone else is behind that benefit. As I mentioned at the very beginning today, there's the recognition of the other. So that involves the medial prefrontal cortex, which is the part of the brain where the two hemispheres come together. But look at this. This researcher also identified a third network, which is about empathy for pain. Because we realize that another person has done something for us, and there was a cost involved for them. We're not talking about a physical pain here, but realize that they made a sacrifice, right? They went out of their way to do something for us. They made our concern their concern, and so that also activates. So multiple networks seem to be involved. Social perspective taking, uh, reward, processing of reward, uh, as well as empathy for pain, it helps us evaluate the cost to the benefactor. So this is just some of the early work uh, showing that, that I think complex social and um, cognitive uh, systems in the brain, are, uh, gratitude is rooted in multiple brain systems, the heart and the head, uh, not surprisingly, given the nature of gratitude. So I, I think that's uh, cool. But also speaking about the physicality of gratitude, and this is something that we could do in like 
five seconds to feel more grateful. We can improve our posture. I don't know, but when I, uh, when I just leave it to default, I start to slump over as I've been doing for the last hour talking to you uh, because we lean in, especially when we have increased screen time, you know, uh, you got your phone, right? And you're leaning in to look at it. Well, why do you think it is that the more pe time people spend on their devices, the, the less happy they are? And there's all kinds of theories for why that's the case. Well, they're, list they're, they're, you know, they're reading about people, you know, negative attitudes and stuff that they're posting. Uh, they feel bad about their own life because they see all these wonderful vacation pictures that people post, right? And so on, all these different explanations. Some of it is purely physiological based on posture. That is when we, we stare at our screens, we tend to lean over or lean in, right? And so that in and of itself affects mood. We know that posture affects emotions. There are postural changes because our brain receives feedback from our musculature, from our periphery, goes up to the brain and impacts our levels of happiness or depression, the opposite. So they did an experiment years ago where they found when people were asked to sit up straight, not only asked to sit up straight, but their backs were kept straight because they were, uh, their backs were taped with this physiotherapy tape, which is a good way to keep your back straight and erect. People felt happier. They felt more excited, enthusiastic, and strong, whereas those who were slumped, which is kind of like the default, you know, for a lot of people, unless you work on your posture, uh, they felt more fearful, hostile, nervous, quiet, so all the opposites of gratitude. So they didn't study gratitude specifically in this study, but when people are grateful, we know that they're more enthusiastic, excited, and strong. So I ask my class when I teach um, Zoom for a long time, every, about every 20 minutes, I say, okay, sit up straight now, right? Take a deep breath, sit up straight, improve your posture. You're gonna feel more positive. You're gonna probably feel more grateful at the same time, just because of the overlap between gratitude and these other positive high activation emotions. So quite apart from thinking about what you're grateful for, making a list of who you're grateful to, just standing up tall or improving posture is a really quick and easy way to make it likelier that you're gonna feel more grateful. So between the brain and the posture, I think these are um, bodily aspects of gratitude that, that often get overlooked because we think of gratitude from the neck up usually, you know, recognition, affirmation, make a list, think about it, reflect on it, recognize, remember, recall, mindfulness, right? It's all about the mind. But gratitude is in the body. There's a physicality to gratitude as well. That for a lot of people, it's the way they get more grateful, whether through exercise, through yoga, through some other uh, activity which engages both the body and the mind is the best way to become more grateful because gratitude is, is a state of mind-body, wholeness and interaction and completion. Okay, so the last part of the talk here, and then I'll open up for uh, questions or comments, discussion, whatever you all have in mind, is how to get more gratitude. So gratitude is good, yes, but there's obstacles to gratitude. It doesn't come easily or naturally to a lot of people. So how do we, how do we grow in gratefulness? How do we become more grateful individuals? Okay. And so I like to say there's an aware, share, a declare, and share process involved in growing our gratitude. So we can approach this from both a um, personal, private, internal perspective or a public, external uh, perspective that involves uh, expressions of gratitude. So there's three main things. Number one, actually two, and then three is a variation on those first two. So there's journaling, which we've talked about, and that's what the research has shown primarily writing in a journal about what you're grateful for is a really good way to increase our gratitude awareness, make us make it more salient, gratitude inducing experiences. That works really, really well for a lot of people. And there's a whole science right now about journaling, what works and what doesn't work. What's the best way to journal? How should you journal? What you should focus on, right? And there's all sorts of nuances there. And I've written about those and some of those are pretty interesting, I think. Uh, another really good way to do it is actually writing a letter of gratitude to someone. Now you not focus on a bunch of different things, but take one person in your life who um, was a really important person in your life. You know, that they touched your life in a special way and you want to acknowledge that person. You want to celebrate what that person has done for you. So you write them a letter, you know, uh, and then you, you don't want to just do an email or, or a phone call, but you want to give them something which will be concrete and tangible that they could keep. And so you spend time constructing a letter, spend a lot of time at it, right? It's, it's, it's nice, it's very thoughtful. 
uh, put on nice stationery, you know, maybe laminate it and actually did this in, in controlled experiments and show that it has a huge effect, a massive effect on both the letter writer as well as the letter receiver. And you know, you may have gotten, you may have received notes of gratitude uh, from people and it feels really good, right? To be appreciated. Just like when you write this letter and you give it to someone or you actually make a visit. So a variation on this is to write a letter, but then say, call up the person and say, you know, assuming you can do that now, if, uh, you know, you're in a region where things are opening up again after the virus, uh, visit with them, hang out with them, talk to them, share the letter, say, you know, I, I wanna give you something. You're giving them a gift. You're expressing your thanks. You're broadcasting your gratefulness to them. It has a huge effect on the happiness of both the letter writer as well as the receiver. In fact, an effect which lasts for months, just a single letter. Now, I know people have contacted me and they've been writing letters. Uh, I've got, a, I got a, uh, an email from, a, actually I got a book from a person who um, was a CEO of a major corporation. He retired, he quit his job and he spent a year writing letters of gratitude to people who had been very formative and influential in his life. And then he went around, he gave all the letters to these people, had visits with all of them. And he, he, he uh, chronicled all of that in a book of his own. So people can you know, make a full-time uh, activity out of this if, if they are able to do so. And it has amazing effects on both them as well as all of their recipients. So, so that's the letter and the visit. Makes you feel good and the recipient feel great also. And then just saying thank you, just broadcasting the gratitude. Just saying, you know, in a very meaningful, genuine way, you know, I am thankful for you or what you did. I am grateful. Uh, the words grateful, saying grateful actually is more powerful than saying thank you. So I think of gratitude as like high octane thankfulness, right? Because it, it implies more that you're aware of the sacrifice they made, that they actually went out of their way to benefit you. And so very small differences can actually be, have, be hugely impactful. And one of which is just expressing gratitude and gratefulness. Uh, thankfulness is good too. They're both better than, you know, being quiet, not saying or not returning the gift. Uh, of uh, thanks that you've been given by someone. So these are all ways to grow in gratitude, aware, declare, and uh, share. Find that person, write a letter, uh, or do, you know, do multiple people over time. I, I have my class do this as an assignment, and uh, they report amazing consequences that makes them feel so much better. Uh, it gives them a perspective. It gives them a realization that, you know, where they are today uh, was made possible by the efforts of so many both living as well as, you know, now passed on. And they hadn't really thought about this before until they were asked to do so. So gratitude is a choice and you can choose to do different things. If you want to grow gratitude, keep a journal, keep a letter. Uh, I like to think about how I use language, how I use words, right? Uh, I think about uh, grateful people have a certain linguistic style. They talk about feeling blessed, feeling lucky, feeling fortunate. And so I, I try to use that language internally, you know, quietly with my own internal private monologue. And that puts me in a more grateful spirit. If I start to use the language of ingratitude, I think about how unfortunate I am, uh, how, you know, what I'm lacking in life or what I haven't been giving, what I'm owed, what I deserved. It's very difficult to conjure gratitude because, you know, entitlement is very, is very poor soil in which to grow gratitude. So I make a choice to, to think to use the language of gratefulness, and that works as well. Okay, let me mention this, because I think this is super important, and this reflects the reality of life again as well. Looking for the good in the bad, okay? Um, you know that many times we think that gratitude is fine for those for whom life is going well, who have, you know, things are going great, relationships are going great, life is good, job is good, kids are doing well, retirement account looks good and all that stuff. But we know certainly these last few months have proven anything is that life is full of bad things, right? And the, the inevitability and unavoidability of stress, whether it's the little stress of daily life or the big traumatic stress. So can you look for the good in the bad? Can you extract possibilities or opportunities out of something bad? Can something good come out of something bad, whether it's you know, job loss or you know, disability? disappointment, defeat, you know, despair. What good can come out of these bad things? So this is a technique that was, I read about in a book written by um, Peter Gomes. Peter Gomes was a um, Harvard minister, professor of theology at Harvard University. Uh, wrote several books, one of which he talked about a lot about gratefulness and thanksgiving. And he said, focus on the bad. 
He said, do this. Think of your worst moments, your sorrows, your losses, your sadness, and then remember. Focus on how you got through the worst day of your life, the trauma, the trial. You endured the temptation. You survived the bad relationship. You're making your way out of the dark. Remember the bad things and then look to see where you are now. So what he's saying is that there's this contrast effect which takes place. And our minds are contrast-making machines. We're always making contrast between, you know, who we are now and who we used to be, who we want to be, what we have now, what we want to have or what we didn't have, you know, uh, how good life used to be. And so he's saying, since we do these comparisons anyway, let's put that comparison to our advantage. Let's, you know, uh, use it to work for us. And one way to do so is to think about the bad thing that happened. And we all have things like that. Maybe we're going through it right now. Maybe it was just we're coming out of it. He's saying it's really beneficial if you can find the opportunity in the bad thing. Look for the good in the bad, a, a, a redemption, right? Going from, from badness to goodness, from dark to light. And that's just super powerful way of developing gratefulness. And I'll tell you the truth, uh, friends, that everyone I've heard from, I would say, yeah, I mean, I'd say basically everyone. I thought 100% of people who contact me who have read something about gratitude or come across my work wherever, they, they will tell me stories about how they did go through the bad. They endured the trial, the trauma, the tribulation, and then they became more grateful because of that. You know, whether it was, uh, I heard from like a 15-year-old teenage girl, she was addicted to drugs, and she found help on a, a happiness app on a phone that had gratitude as one of the happiness inducing activities. And she looked me up and wrote to me and said, that gave her now freedom from addiction after being addicted to drugs at the age of 15, right? I've, I've heard from people who are uh, adult survivors of physical sexual abuse as kids, uh, now start to live gratefully now only decades later, having gone from that darkness to, to a place of survival, a place, a place of lightness, okay? A woman in her late 80s wrote to me and said she'd been seriously depressed three or four different times in her life. And now finally she discovered the power of gratitude and grateful living in her late 80s. Get that. And she was destined and determined to become 100 years old. And she believed gratitude would help her get there. Her goal was to become a centenarian, uh, you know. And so it was always the bad turning into something good set the stage for gratitude. It was never the case. Oh, my life was going great. You know, I was happy, you know, I was making a lot of money, successful. And then I thought, well, I'll, I'll become a little more grateful now. That'll be a little icing on the cake. You know, it was always something really bad that turned into something good when people were at their depths. They, they, their holes so deep, they had to reach up just to touch the bottom. That set the stage for grateful living. Addiction, affliction, in, in all its different variations and expressions, that's, that's where gratitude comes from. And I think that's super that's super hopeful, but also says something super important, I think, about the resiliency of the human spirit. So I wrote an article on this. If it, you're motivated to go deeper, uh, of course, I'm not the only one who's talked about the link between gratitude and adversity or gratitude and affliction. But uh, the Greater Good Science Center is located at UC Berkeley, and they've done an amazing job at putting together all of the research on things like happiness and contentment and meaning in life and gratefulness, and, and all the good topics that people are interested in, uh, what I call spiritual realities, love and humility and forgiveness and, and hope and so on. So about seven years ago, I wrote an article that came out of, it was an excerpt from my Gratitude Works book about how gratitude can help us through hard times. And I, I reread that recently. I think it's still, it still has some uh, useful uh, ideas in there that gratitude is good all times, not just during good times, but it's important then because it helps us celebrate our successes, but it helps us get through the, the lean times, the bad times as well. It helps us keep perspective. And so um, there's research on that too, which I won't uh, get into today. Now, if you want to go personal, I recommend this article uh, by a professor at Biola University, which is in uh, Southern California. And I've done some collaboration uh, with some of the faculty at Biola University. Uh, he wrote about his own life, what he was going through, uh, connecting the spirituality of suffering and gratitude together from a spiritual Christian perspective. And he sees gratitude as a means of grace. Um, I won't get into all the detail because you may want to read this, I will, so that I won't, this won't be a, a spoiler. But he talks about how, how you know, in the, in the midst of trials and tribulation and pain and, 
and suffering and loss and darkness, brokenness, this is the, the, the ground that allowed gratitude to break through. You know, it's like when a, when a weed breaks through in the cement, right? It came through and it came through loud and clear in his life. Writing about gratitude cleansed the window of my soul that had been darkened by blame, resentment, and disappointment, right? And so, uh, so it's amazing whether you, whether you see it in, you know, controlled experimental trials, whether you read it in scripture or you, whether you read it in people's real lives, I think there is a very strong and definite link between uh, suffering and gratitude. It doesn't mean it's inevitably going to lead to gratitude, but uh, it certainly can be a window and a passageway, a portal into greater gratitude. Well, here's someone who certainly knew a lot about suffering and who saw a lot of terrible things when he was in the Nazi concentration camps, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Uh, who uh, wrote a lot about gratitude in his works, in his uh, journals, about gratefulness in the midst of, you know, suffering and uh, despair that he saw all around him. Uh, he said that in ordinary life, we hardly realize that we receive a great deal more than we give, and that it is only with gratitude that life becomes rich. I just love this perspective, and I love this quote. We, we hardly ever think about it, but we're much, we receive much more than we give. And that sets the stage for gratitude. That makes life rich. Gratitude is what makes life worth living. Whether it's good times or bad times, gratitude is perspective by which we can you know, gain a firmer and more accurate and truthful representation of what is going on in our lives with all the benefits that we saw come from grateful living, from the grateful mind, and the grateful heart. Well, so Lockie said I could do uh, shameful self-promotion. So I've written a few books. If you want to go deeper and you know, they're really just, uh, I just uh, kind of assemble my thoughts and describe the science in the, the first couple of books and actually the last book as well, Little Book of Gratitude. But I have like, you know, quotes and, and sayings from people like Bonhoeffer. I tell the stories of the people that have told me about their lives and about how their lives have been transformed by the power of gratefulness because it's something we need to, we need to celebrate. Uh, we need to broadcast that and distribute that because uh, I think a lot of people don't know about these findings yet. And uh, the more they learn about it, the more we can have this, this gratitude transformation, this global gratitude movement. That gratitude is something that we all need that's in short supply. And it doesn't always come easily or naturally. And so when Sir John Templeton asked me 20 years ago, said to me, Dr. Evans, how can we get 6 billion people around the world to practice gratitude? Now the population is 7 billion. And so he thought it was that important it was that vital to the future of humanity. He wanted everyone to benefit from grateful living, right? And so I can only do so much as one person, you know, one scientist, one writer, one speaker. And fortunately, other people have now taken up the cause, carrying the torch of gratitude forward in, in science and in, in medicine and, 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 and in, and in uh, religion, theology. You know, I talk to pastors and, and others who, you know, and it's great because they're open to the scientific findings because more times than not, they, they ratify uh, what's in the ancient scriptures. So it's always beautiful when these things come together. And it's fun to do. And it's been a real uh, pleasure and honor to uh, just to be able to study gratitude, to do this for a living. You know, it's almost like too good to be true. Uh, so 20 years, we have at least 20 more years of work remaining. Uh, I don't know, we probably have 20 minutes or so remaining today. So I'm happy now to take any questions. Uh, that you might. Before we get to the question, I'll just go to this one. In case you want to contact me, I'd love to hear from you. If you don't have time today, you asked your question. You can email me a question. I'm happy to take those. Um, you can follow me on the uh, Twitter. That's uh, Dr. Underscore, uh, Ro Dr. Robert Emmons. I have a Facebook for gratitude, which is Gratitude Works. And then um, I'm recently beginning a project uh, where we have uh, a, a huge grant, a good sized grant to help other people study gratitude to God. So we had this competition, this request for proposals. We had psychologists, we had philosophers, we had theologians, these are all academic type folks, uh, submit research proposals to further understand spiritual gratitude or gratitude to God, which really has been not so much study compared to relational person to person gratitude. So we're, we're making decisions actually right now this month, and we're going to be funding about 20 projects on specifically looking at gratitude to God. So super excited about that. You can read about that. We have a website that describes that research and 
in July, we'll have a description of the award winners and their projects and be, be great for uh, keeping up with what's going on uh, in the field of uh, gratitude science. So that's the end of my formal presentation. If we want to turn on the chat or people just want to ask questions, however you want to do it, I'm happy to take questions right now. Thank, Thank you, you all for your attention and listening. I know it's really hard to sit and listen to one person talk, stare at a screen. So, uh, so I commend you. Uh, I'm grateful to you, each one of you, for uh, your uh, faithfulness and your attention this morning. Thank you for that. Thank you so much, Dr. Emmons. Um, wow, I think, I think during this pandemic time that we've been doing the, the, the speakers and just the perfect order for us to be uh, entering into gratefulness right now. And you really have given us so much. This is another banquet, right, Giovanna? <laughs> an, an all you can eat buffet. And I, I was thinking uh, we are called Hope for Life and people come to us looking for hope and I wrote this down. I think what you gave us today is like a super highway to hope. Instead of, right? Like when we need to quickly get into a state of hope. Yes. I think gratitude is, is a, a, I mean, you have just completely blown our minds. So um, I want to ask everyone who, we won't have time to answer all the questions. I just opened the chat. Mm -hmm. But really just unmute yourself and ask the question. Um, because that's the quickest way to do it right now. I have, I have uh, one second, everyone, please. I have two I have people texting me questions. So like Gigi said, the thing is open now. Gigi, you want them to type it or to unmute no, them? No, just unmute themselves. Uh, but sometimes if, if you ask the question, maybe we can, we can look and see which one can we can. Anna, Anna, you had a question. Do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, I did it. I, I want to thank uh, the Dr. Emmons for the great uh, talk. Uh, in our family, we, we started the five of us, but the two little ones just drop off because they are, they are two little six years old. It's her birthday. But we're very Happy thankful birthday. for your talk. Thank you. So one of the things I, I, I was shocked to hear when you say our brain in the past, in the history, was mm. automatically going into the negativity, right? Yeah. And it's a way to defend ourselves from mechanism. I tend to see in my personality uh, that even though I do the journaling every day and I tend to practice gratitude, my brain is still going to the negative all the yes. time. Like I tend to be judging the bad things or scared of the bad things. And even though I try to be thankful for the bad things, I tend to get depressed and, and, mm -hmm. and very negative. So I don't know how in the practical, apart yeah. from generally, how to switch those thoughts. Well, I think that's excellent. Thank you for that. Um, there are, you know, uh, propensities that people have because we, we don't come into the gratitude uh, business or practice with a blank slate, you know, like a erased board. We have, we have a personal history. Uh, we have our own, you know, uh, maybe, uh, G genes, genetic influence that we inherited, you know, we have learned ways of coping, dealing with situations. We could have had a lot of, you know, crises and, and um, you know, difficult situations. So we're kind of just, you know, uh, more vigilant, more th thoughtful about what could go wrong because we've, we've had to deal with that. That's been part of our history, part of who we are. And, you know, others have been more fortunate. And so maybe their, their negativity dial is turned down more and so it might be, you know, it's so um, it's not equally easy for people to develop gratitude based on their their beginning point. So think about it like on a on a scale, maybe like a a, a a one to ten, right? So ten is the most grateful, most positive. One would be the least grateful, least positive. And somebody starts, let's say, at a two or a three because of difficult background or difficult current life circumstances, right? And others because they have more benefits or privileges or opportunities, maybe they start at seven or an eight. So it's easier for them because they have less, um, less ground they have to cover. The road to the finish line, if you want to think about it that way, is shorter. So it might take a little bit more work for the person at the one or the two or the three to get to the eight or nine or 10. Now they can do that. They actually, actually have the most uh, to benefit from a gratitude practice because they have the most room to grow. Okay. So you're always going to have, and we wouldn't want to get rid of the negativity bias, right? We, we wouldn't want to get rid of being concerned about threats 
or things that could go wrong because that helps us become planful, right? We take steps. We want to protect our families. We want to protect ourselves, right, from whatever it is. So we want, never want to be in a position where we just ignore all that possibility of, you know, bad things happening, right? Uh, and I like to give the example of how you don't want to be too optimistic uh, when you get on an airplane. Uh, you, you, want, you want the flight crew to be pessimists, right? You want them to think about all the things that could go wrong. So they make sure they check all the dials and all the settings and all, make sure everything is working well. You want them to think, well, this plane has always, worked, always gotten us on the ground before, right? It's always gotten up in the air. We've always landed and you don't care about anything. So you have to be thoughtful and mindful and, and check. And so, you know, uh, whether you call that negativity or just, just realistic bias, right? It's becoming more planful and problem solving. So it, it doesn't negate gratefulness or positivity. It's just a, a more realistic perspective, right? So it's, it's not being overwhelmed. So the key is not to be overwhelmed by the negative, but in keeping that in perspective and just allowing, you know, have these grateful moments and hopeful moments just sometimes just as, as a breather or a break or a respite from the negativity. So it gives us, um, it, it's like, uh, it, it's like an immune system, right? It's like getting an immunization to help us deal with physical health threats. Gratitude is part of our psychological immune system that help, that can help us deal with the, the psychological threats, right? So if we build that in, we'll be in a stronger, better place to deal with the problems that, that will be inevitable in life. Does that make sense? Yes, I, I totally understand now a little better. Yeah. All right. Wow, well, that was wonderful. Gratitude is part of our psychological immune system. Immune system. Wow. We build that up, right? We, we have this toolbox or immune system, right? We put enough tools in there, hope, love, faith, right? Other people, gratefulness. And so when the stuff comes to us, you know, obviously we're still impacted by it. We'd rather not have to face it, but now at least we, we have, uh, we have a perspective by which we have some tools we can bring to bear to help solve or resolve uh, these situations. Wow. There's a question in the first one I saw in the chat was about teaching, um, talking to children or my son from Carlos about gratitude. That's a really, really good question. In fact, that's one of the ones which is often asked about, uh, and even though it's been often asked of me, I, I uh, still don't have a really good answer for that about teaching kids gratitude. And from personal experience, I know that I have two boys, four years apart. Now they're big, they're old, they're 23 and 19, but, and they're very different from each other. So one of them was always very grateful, uh, very thankful, appreciative. And the other one, not in, ungrateful, but you know, just, just, just less, uh, it wasn't part of who he was, didn't come as easily. And so uh, kids within the same family can be very, very different from each other. And like every parent knows that, right? No matter what we do or how we think we raise them, you know, they, they turn out to be totally opposite uh, from each other. But uh, the question is good because we want to convey gratefulness. We want to teach that as a value, right? We want to raise grateful kids. Uh, and I don't, I, I do know that it all depends on the age. So, you know, what we would do with, with children, little kids, right, smaller ones, is, is they're, they're very visual uh, and very practically focused. So I know of families who have done things which are very um, practically focused, right, very visual. So they might engage in traditions or rituals, whether it's around the, you know, meal table, just obviously saying thanks or being grateful, or just, you know, talking about what they're thankful for at, during times during the day or in the evening. So finding those opportunities to express gratitude to them. So I think when, when parents become good role models and teachers of gratitude, it's really the best way. Because you know we, we can't give our kids things we ourselves don't have, right? So if we don't have gratitude, if they hear us complaining or being resentful or entitled, right? Or blaming other people or agencies or government or whoever when things are going poorly, uh, they can't possibly grow up to be grateful, right? Because they have very poor role models because they're watching us, you know, they are. Uh, they're looking at us, things are rubbing off on them. And so if we express gratitude and then when we see it in them, if we reinforce it, we say, hey, you know, that was great when you expressed, you know, gratitude to your teacher, to whoever. We, we, so we, we um, uh, you know, call it to mind, we, we reward it, we celebrate it when we see it and we become ourselves good role models for it, I think is, is some of the best ways to, uh, to give them the gift of gratitude. Oh, thank you. Um, Dr. Emmons, that was very good. You know, um, we get asked that a lot. 
mm. from parents about their kids. And uh, when I turn the parents back onto themselves to help their kids, they don't like it too much. No, they don't like it. No, they don't like it because uh, they don't they don't understand that our, our kids are modeled by us, whether it's gratitude, whether it's love, whether it's gratefulness, whatever. And as and you said it, they we can give them what we don't have. That's right. one of our famous lines that we Oh, can. is that right? Yeah, that's one of our famous lines. Because if we can't give what we don't have, and we can't give them what we don't have. So then, then with epigenetics and all this teaching on healing and all, then when we get well, then the kids start getting well. We notice that all the time. So if we're grateful, maybe our kids will be grateful finally. Well, and I've noticed, I learned from my kids too, especially oh, yeah. as they got older. Yeah. Uh, just their uh, spontaneous, especially our younger son is the more grateful one, just spontaneous gratitude. Uh, thankfulness, you know, times where I, I would find it easy to go to my default complaint mode. And yeah. then I would see his, you know, I don't think he's ever said a negative word about anyone in his life. Right. I can't say that. You know, I don't, I hardly go a day without doing that. Right. But that's just the way he is. You and, and I, I get along very well. I complain all day long to it. I'm, I'm from the East coast. So I, I attribute that to being from the East coast and it's a different, uh, way of life. But anyway, um, I see that I say, I've learned from him. You know, so part of the equation, I think, is reciprocal, right? That we can, our gratitude can rub off on them, but their gratitude can rub off on us uh, as well. And then yeah. it certainly gives us a new frame of reference. When we see aspects of ourselves in them, we know that we're having an impact. Well, that picture you had earlier of everyone being grat gratitude is contagious. All this yeah. stuff is contagious. Love right. is contagious. Gratitude is contagious. Anger is contagious. Mm. Uh, ingratitude is contagious. Thank you. I just... It really I, is. I heard you saying that and I wanted to say that. Thank you, though. It really is. Thank you for that. You, know, it's funny <laughs> that you said that, Lucky, because I was thinking this, this has to become contagious after today. Because you said uh, that when you started this work, there were, you wanted to impact 6 billion people and now it's 7 billion. And imagine if everyone who's watching today does something like just today, we start changing today, improving, like ramping up the volume in our gratefulness. What's going to happen in our home, in our neighborhood, in our churches, synagogues? Just, wow. I think we can change the world now, Jovi. Yes, uh, I appreciate the optimism. I mean, just just be, just be uh, one act of gratitude. You know, I, I sometimes give that as a homework assignment in my class. I say, okay, go out and find someone and express words of gratitude to them. Maybe somebody who maybe doesn't get much thanks, someone who's behind the scenes, Right, maybe it's you know a custodian, you know at, at the university. Maybe it's a housekeeper at a hotel, or you know a server at a restaurant. Well, they get a lot of thanks, but maybe a TSA agent at an airport. You know they don't get too much gratitude, right? And uh, uh, talk words of blessing to them uh, of of gratitude. Uh, I I heard this story about this football player at Stanford University, and he thanked I guess the the dormy state, and they have like a housekeeper. That's pretty good, right? Have somebody come and change, wash your bedding for you, change your sheets, right? And so one day he decides to thank her, right? He says, you know, I really appreciate how I come back to my dorm room on every Tuesday and how wonderful it is to get into bed with these clean, crisp sheets. He said, thank you very much. And she looked at him and she started crying. She said, you know, I've been doing this job for 10 years and you're the only person who's ever thanked me, right? It totally, you know, changed her life. She, you know, got a new sense of, you know, probably trust in, in the goodness of humanity. There's just one. And so you could be that person. You could be that one to, to broadcast that gratitude, to be the, be the source of somebody else's gratefulness. You know, it's a wonderful privilege to be able to do that. Well, I want to expand on what Gigi and you are saying. And I don't think it's just a matter of using words and talking. It's actually living it out, whether it's yeah. love, forgiveness, gratitude, acting it out all the time. I, 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 you guys are saying some very deadly stuff. So <clears throat> our group loves homework. So I think we, you can leave us that homework and we'll make sure everyone reports and, and we'll grade that homework. Okay, I like that. So I think you guys, you all have a homework. There's 103 people here right now, plus whoever it's doubles. Um, or families like Gary and Anna are there with their family. Um, that's a homework for today. So can you tell us the homework? 
<laughs> Explain the homework. So we have to go out there today. You, yeah, I mean, um, find someone and, and express words of gratitude uh, for something, for who they are, for what they've done. I really appreciate the fact that you are here doing this job. I mean, you look at the gratitude that was expressed to healthcare workers you know, during the virus. Uh, what about people who maybe are, are getting some, uh, are not getting some gratitude right now in society, right? Uh, and then you, what, what a transformation, transformational moment that could be that, hey, someone notices me, right? Someone appreciates me. It could be at your workplace, it could be at your home, it could be in your neighborhood, right? Uh, so whatever, whatever uh, environment you're in, find that person who is otherwise neglected or ignored, who's behind the scenes, you know, and um, their, their, their work is valuable. I mean, in the university here, the professors are the ones who get most of the acknowledgments and, and credit, right? Uh, but yet, how many people do we depend upon to make it possible for us to do what we do? Uh, how many people are, when I go to a talk or give a talk like this, you know, uh, online, is that how many people are responsible for making that possible, for arranging this, for, for inviting me? for making sure the technology works, you know? I always say, I have the easy job, I just go and talk, right? And I can do that pretty much anywhere, and I do, anywhere or through any, any means like this medium, but it's all the people, the audience that makes it possible. And uh, it's, it's just when we realize that, we look at life so differently, right? We think about it, and that's really the spiritual quest, I think, is looking at life, seeing the, seeing the invisible behind the visible. Seeing the how how we have this 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 ocean of uh, invisible realities and gratitude helps us tap into that, mm -hmm. and it's just a form of awareness that a lot of times we we just overlook or take for granted, and we become aware of that at a much deeper, fine grained level. It just changes everything, you know. It really uh, makes life worth living in a, in a very new and different way. Wow, that's 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 so so good and. I can tell you one thing um, from our experience from about, I think started like 10 years ago, <laughs> um, financially, we ended up losing everything, mm. everything. everything. And, um, Without exaggerating, um, everything. From, you know, for many, many years living in the top neighborhoods, I mean, all the best of the best. And, um, before I knew it, we ended up in my mother's house, going from a nearly 5,000 square feet home to my mother's house. So um, I can tell you it was so hard. And um, I realized I was sinking in. I realized there were days I didn't even want to get out of bed. I realized it was so sad, you know? And um, one of the things that got me going and one of the things I want to say to I hope for life is a redemption of that time of our losses of our suffering um hope for life was birth you know yeah. so otherwise this would have not been birth so one of the things we're grateful today now that we look back it's this wouldn't have not been happening but yes. one thing is that I made it a choice I mean, I made it a choice. I said to myself, I'm either going to die depressed or try to climb out of this. And I made it a choice every day to find things that I was grateful for. And even though there were small things or someone allowed me in in traffic where I thought I was going to miss my exit. Thank you. Um, and, you know, I thought I was never going to laugh again, have joy again. And just being grateful for small things, my mother's house, that we were there, we were not somewhere else, you know, we were not under a bridge. And um, so I thank my mother for that home every day, uh, our parents that allowed us in. And every day, just little, little, little things. And before I knew it, in a year and a half, I found myself laughing again, enjoying life again, um, just, not making a point, I had to make it a point every day. It was a choice. And yes. before I knew it, it was just flowing out of me. So from my experience, I can tell you that saved me 
from plunging into depression and sadness, you know? So, I think so true. Thank you for sharing that. It's a choice. Sometimes that first choice is a hard choice. Yeah. But then that choice sometimes becomes easier. The, the next subsequent choices become more and more easier as there's more and more to build upon. It's kind of like laying, you know, steps in a foundation, right? Or steps on a, uh, on a ladder where you start building and then they build upon each other over time. And you find more and more things to be thankful for. And sometimes it's small. Sometimes it's just, I'm thankful that nothing bad happened today. Uh, you know, and then before long, uh, you, you add more and more and then it just multiplies. Mm. And then also that gave us the opportunity to be, we were always giving to people. We always gave, gave. And for the first time I had to receive, you mm. know, and that was also not easy at the beginning, but later it became like, you know, I had to accept it. And I realized how that also began to change some dynamics inside of me, you know? So That's really important, Giovanna. The heart, the difficulty of receiving. Mm. Uh, a lot of us like to give gifts. I much rather give a gift than receive a gift. Yeah. Because when I receive a gift, sometimes I feel embarrassed or I feel it's it's too much. I'm not in, I'm not worthy of it, deserving of it. So you have to realize that yes, you know, we're deserving of goodness, of good things, uh, you know, um, appreciation, being valued by other people. And if we have a definition of ourselves, which says that, you know, we're not worthy of that, we're too difficult on ourselves, or we were told that we were never good enough or smart enough or kind enough or whatever enough, uh, you know, we have a very negative view of ourselves. It's a very, very difficult experience of gratitude because we, re we reject the gift. You mm. know, we have to become a, a good receiver and that makes us a better giver at the same time. Yes, yes. Uh, I wanna give a shout out to Mel. Is he still here with us from Beth Orr? Okay, he's not here because I know he had a question and I just wanted to give him an opportunity, but. Uh, I'm seeing lots of questions. I wish I had a chance to, an to answer them all. Uh, I do, uh, there are a couple of people who wanted to get copies of the slides. And so you guys, you can just, uh, of course this, this was recorded so you can watch the Zoom meeting again. Uh, but I can, I'm happy to send you, I can send you a PDF or it's a very big file. So hopefully it'll be able to be received by your, um, your server. Uh, just email me at that address, uh, the Emmons at ucdavis.edu, and I can also answer questions that way, you know, privately once the, the call is over. Uh, well, I'm going to go home at breakfast, but I'll, I'll get back to you within a couple of days. Uh, <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> I, I'm happy to hear from you, and uh, I learn a lot from my audiences. You know, I know that's just kind of a, uh, a saying that pe the teachers say they learn a lot from their students and so on, uh, but in, in this case, it's true. And uh, this keeps me inspired to do more research and give more, do more writing on gratitude because I know when I hear from people, when I talk uh, to people live in person, uh, I just see, I see it in their eyes, you know, the power of, of gratefulness. They have a story they want to tell. They have experiences like so many of you have shared. And uh, that's deeply meaningful to me and inspiring. And, and, and I want to be able to help people articulate their stories. And if I can add a little data or science, you know, I think that that's all the better because we love that. We, we're, we're deeply spiritual beings, but we're also, you know, I think uh, at, our, at our root, at our core, we're, we're skeptics. And so we like to see the studies. We like to see that, you know, kind of what we thought all along was, is now confirmed by the science. And so I, I'm in a lucky position to be able to do both of those. Thank you. Do we have one more question, Gigi? Just one more, and then yeah, tell Gigi to choose um, one. Choose one. Um, oh my goodness! <laughs> give you the hard job of choosing one, so then they'll love you or hate you, whichever comes first. <laughs> well, I'm grateful for for both because one of them makes me feel good. The other one is an opportunity to forgive them. <laughs> <laughs> I know Nuri's had a question. Um, and she said here, have you been able to measure how long it takes to change our default thinking from negative bias to positive bias when we intentionally practice gratefulness? Three weeks. <laughs> no, uh, oh, that was so quick, we could have another next question. <laughs> next time. No, uh, actually, uh, that's largely true. I mean, when they, they do research on how long it takes to change a habit, Mm -hmm. and I don't know exactly why that's a magical period. 21 days. Yeah, 21 days, right? You've heard this too, right? So and that's how I think probably why we, although I didn't do this consciously, uh, why I made our original gratitude intervention journaling studies 21 days. 
it's, it's like it's like long enough so it becomes something which is more i think uh systematic and intent you have to pay attention to it uh but you don't want you don't want to go too long that you you get tired of it or it becomes a burden you know i think some of these things when we, when we try to do them as i mentioned before this to-do list they, they become a problem becomes a burden it makes life uh heavier and burdensome and we want life to be easier and lighter and freer and that's what gratitude does but 21 days seems to work pretty well, but that doesn't mean you just stop there after 21 days. Uh, it's kind of like a physical exercise. I think that's a good analogy. So you could do a physical or change your diet, and then maybe, you know, you cheat on a little bit, you know, you have that donut or whatever, right? It's a cake, and then you go back and you work on it some more, and the same with gratitude. So you could have like a 21 day, do it consecutively, but then like have a booster session. So maybe once a week or twice a week, and that will help you sustain that over time. And we've actually found that. We found that people six months, a year later, were still practicing. They were still consciously doing the gratitude journaling, even though they no longer had to because they weren't in the study anymore. But it just, because it fertilizes itself, it reinforces, you want to do it. You don't want to go back, right? It's like people, when they start exercising, they don't want to just stop because they realize the benefit. They feel bad when they stop. And so I think it's the same thing with gratitude. So, I mean, it could be more than 21 days, but I think after 21 days, you'll have a pretty good, you know, um, feel for the improvement. You're going to see that and other people will see it in you. And that's a great thing too. And you, you don't just notice it in yourself, but you know, spouses, family, coworkers, they say, you know, what's changed. And then you, you become more attracted to them. They want to get more of this gratitude too, because they see it changing you so that you get into this upward spiral, this contagion and so forth. And that's a beautiful thing to see too, when it operates in families or, or workplaces. Wow. Well, I, I wanted to remind everyone, uh, Dr. Uh, Emmons has given us all an assignment. And so if I put it on the chat, but just in case you haven't seen it. So when you're done with your assignment, remember he to told us about broadcasting it. Uh, so let's broadcast it. Can you read it? Is it? Oh, okay. Yes. I'm gonna, oh, okay. yes. So you are going to tag at Hope for Life on social media. And also tag Dr. Emmons at Dr. Underscore Robert Emmons and do a hashtag gratitude works. Okay? Hashtag gratitude works because we can get some gratitude trending today. That would be great. <laughs> yes. And it's not to promote hope for life, it's to promote gratitude. It's a better alternative to some of the things which trend on social media. So we, we need the message of gratitude, I think, more than ever. Yes. And um, before everyone leaves and before we let you go, Doc, uh, Dr. Emmons, we wanted to say again, thank you so much. Um, we are grateful. <laughs> See, I learned thank it. Thank you for we having me. Grateful. Thank you is not enough. You have to say, we yeah, are grateful. grateful. <laughs> like, sorry is not enough. Forgive me, you have to say. Remember okay. we were taught that once, you know? So, um, <laughs> we're very grateful. And before everyone leaves, we want to say also to all the parents, all the dads in the group today, we want to wish you all a happy Father's Day. We want to tell you that we're very grateful for all the dads here. And we want to remind you. And the grandfathers you, too. And the grandparents, uh, granddads. And the sons who are dads and yes, all the dads. All the, all the dads here today. Um, we want to um, tell you firstly, we are very grateful um, to have dads um, and um, we want to remind you that you play an important role in all of our lives. Um, you are the core um, of homes and things and it's important to have dads around. And um, Moms too, but when Giovanna used to tell me that I used to get very angry with her, but I now begin to understand that that's the masculine and the male is very, very important in a family. A healthy you know? mask. A, a grateful, healthy, healthy, a grateful, a grateful masculine. masculine. <laughs> yes. Yes. A grateful dad is yes. very good very to important. have around. Yes. So we wish you all that in this group today a very, very, very happy Father's Day. And I know many are not biological dads, but let me tell you, to be spiritual dads, to be mentors of somebody, that goes as well, you know? So uh, for those of here that are not biological parents to anyone, but they have many spiritual people um, that they help, that they mentor, 
thank you too. And that goes for you too. So happy, happy Father's Day. Um, Dr. Dr. Emmett. Dr. Jovi, Mel is back online. Oh. Mel, are you back? Oh, Where's you're muted, Mel. Oh, are you talking to me? No, Mel. I, I, I never left. I was just multitasking. Oh. oh. So do you <clears throat> want to ask Dr. Emmons your question, Mel? Before actually, we leave. Well, me. actually, the question I asked during the first half was so beautifully answered by Dr. Emmons in the second half. And basically, when he reminded us that it's so important to have the quote-unquote toolkit, mm. so that when life happens and things happen, that we use that toolkit, that, that was very, very helpful to me. So this has been a great workshop. We are blessed at Temple Beth Or to have as partners Giovanna, Lockie, and everyone from Hope for Life. We're just, it's just a beautiful, loving partnership. Thank you, Mel. Dr. Emmons, we, um, we rent from okay. Temple and um, uh, to be able to do our classes on Saturdays. And um, so they gracefully share the space with us. So Mel, um, it's a member and he has been the president of the board of director there for many, many years. Okay. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mel. We love you. <laughs> Same here. So Dr. Emmons, God bless you. I, we cannot say enough. And I think we all can give you a round of applause. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, thank you. We love you and we bless you. Well, wonderful, wonderful time today. Thank you, Joanna. Like you wonderful, beautiful couple and beautiful ministry. And I'm grateful to have spent a little part of that time with you uh, today. And hopefully someday we'll meet in person. Yes, and hopefully Great. you can talk again. <laughs> I'd love to. Yes, thank you. Thank you all. Appreciate Bye. that. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Evans.